No clear trend for earnings season, no clear direction for financial markets. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Boston. And I'm Scarlett Fu. We're kicking you off to the closing bell here in the U.S. Now, this was supposed to be a seasonally stronger period for U.S. equities, but you're not seeing that play out this week. In fact, once again on a Friday, you have equities lower. Nobody necessarily wants to be long heading into a weekend. And in fact, the S&P is set to close down about 2.5% for the second straight week, entering a correction, a 10% drop from its recent high. And of course, the Nasdaq 100 entered a correction yesterday, but it is recovering a little bit today thanks to Intel and thanks to Amazon powering up big tech. The 10-year yield moving marginally here is still at about 4.84%. Uh, the two-year yield uh, moving in the other direction, but not a whole lot to glean from the yield action or lack of action today. There is movement higher in oil prices up by almost 3% for WTI to 85.67. But for the week, uh, oil prices are down. And in fact, oil is set to post its first weekly decline, decline since the Israel-Hamas war began for now as the war remains contained. Romain? Yeah, the confluence of events that we've seen this week have really batted the markets around. And then you talk about the economic picture, Scarlett. Two big data points this week that may bode well for the economy or it also might be a harbinger for more pain on the interest rate side. Thursday's blowout quarterly U.S. GDP number, that was followed this Friday by a relatively strong monthly report on personal spending. It showed household demand still burning bright and strong. Personal consumption expenditures up 0.7% in September. That's almost double the rate that we saw in August. And even when you adjust sales for inflation, they came in at 0.4%. That's four times the pace from the previous month. Jay Powell and company will certainly have a lot to parse when they go to into that meeting uh, starting next Tuesday. But curiously, the strength in that government data on consumer spending isn't actually translating into strength in corporate sales. This is particularly for companies that make those big ticket items. Appliance maker Whirlpool this week saying it's having to offer more and more promotional discounts, which of course is cutting into profits. Brunswick Corp, which makes Sea Ray and Bayliner boats, they also cut their forecast after reporting a 6% drop and overall quarterly revenue. And Harley-Davidson, a 20% plunge in motorcycle shipments with the executive saying on a conference call that a lot of customers, even those with high credit worthiness, they're put off by elevated interest rates. That was a snapshot of the more than 160 S&P companies that reported this week. A similar tally is on deck for next week, Scarlett. And Gare Lode, head of global equities over at Federated Hermes, I thought put it best. He said the earnings season so far has left much to be desired, typically for economically sensitive stocks that, well, have held up well against a relatively difficult backdrop. But what we've seen so far, Scarlett, means that there are starting to see some pressure from those higher interest rates. Yeah, some cracks are starting to appear, and that is showing up most clearly in the forecast. We heard from Meta and Mattel warning of economic uncertainty next year. Ford withdrew its outlook because of the strike. So here's how this is all showing up in earnings estimates going forward. We've now seen six straight weeks of earnings downgrades, with the pace really accelerating in the last four weeks alone. So when you add it all up, U.S. stocks have now posted back-to-back -back weekly losses. On Wednesday, the S&P 500 closed below 4,200. There we go. Uh, that's a key technical level. And according to Bank of America's Michael Hartnett, it's now at risk of falling even more. He sees the next support level at 3941, right here, that gap, uh, which is the 200-week moving average. Most of the time, as you can see, the market has bounced back after nearing that trend line. Those are all the circles that we have here. The exceptions, of course, was a great financial crisis right around here. And the early days of the COVID lockdown in March 2020. Romain? All right, let's kick things off to the close with Alicia Levine, head of investment strategy and equity advisory solutions over at BNY Mellon Wealth Management. Alicia, great to have you here in studio. On great, a, great to be with you on a Friday afternoon. Uh, absolutely. And I mean, let's talk a little bit, I think, what Scarlett was kind of hitting on, this idea that this is still kind of a market that's kind of, I don't know, just kind of just... I know, floating around in the water, I guess, waiting for some sort of all clear. We didn't necessarily get that from earnings so far, and the earnings season isn't over. Uh, do you expect that we maybe see a shift in sentiment at all this year? So I think your point that there's no direction, I think investors really have no conviction either way, mm -hmm. because there are still signals that the economy's strong enough and quite strong. We'll, we'll call third quarter GDP in the rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. We don't invest in the rearview mirror. We invest going forward. But earnings season has not been overall very strong, and that that is giving investors pause. The 5% yields, let's talk about that. I mean, that is really when we started seeing sentiment yeah. come off 
the no landing scenario because ultimately high for longer means you're going to affect the real economy. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that because I, I did think that what's interesting to hear this come up often on the conference calls, particularly with the consumer companies. And I'm, you know, I mentioned motorcycles and boats, the things that most people have to finance. And if they're looking at interest rates that are in the double digit percentages, particularly for an item like a boat, which let's face it, most of us don't need a boat, uh, uh, you know, you're going to hold off, right? You know, most of us don't need a motorcycle. Well, it's, what's very interesting yeah. is that those large goods like that yeah. were actually the sectors that had done so well coming out of COVID. That's mm -hmm. where the overbuying in the goods sector was. Mm -hmm. Those large purchases financed with 0% interest rates. So I don't think it's simply the financing piece of it. It's also the fact that once you buy a boat in You're 2021, you may not need <laughs> yeah. one in 2023 so quickly. Same with the motorcycle. So those large capital goods simply are, are I think the demand is simply normalizing mm. to, you know, what you see on the trend line add the financing costs on that, and that's where you're going to have the problem. So to your point about, well, how can it be that companies aren't doing that well when the consumer spending really is, is blowing the light bulbs off? And it's really the difference between what the S&P is and what the real economy is. And the real economy is much more consumption driven. And the S&P has many more um, industrials yep. and, and, you Good know, point. more yep. of those kinds of old economy stocks in it than the actual real GDP number. I want to go back to that point of 5% yield being kind of a triggering point. Um, a lot of people talk about 5% breaking something. Is it really going to break something like a redux of the bank stresses that we saw in March? Or is it more of that normalizing that you just talked about where a couple of companies really benefited from the reopening of the economy? And now it's going back to maybe the way it should have been before the before COVID. So I don't think any any yield number is the breaking point. I think it's the transition from one and a half or one percent yields to five percent. That's the problem. And I think you have to look at the previous, let's call it 13, 14 years as the anomaly in the rates complex. And I think we're going back to something that's much more typical where there is a cost of money, real yields are positive, and there is some, um, you know, there is some waiting in how you think about where to allocate capital and it's not so simple just throw it all into stocks and I, I think that is coming back. The transitions are not easy but let's just remember in periods of five percent yields investors did, did quite well yeah. and, and and you know investors did, investors did quite well in a three percent inflation world also. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to a place with slightly more inflation, slightly higher yields, slightly higher Fed funds rate than we did previous decade Investors can do quite well. It's that transition period. And that's what we're in. We're feeling the discomfort of going from one regime to another. So no one knows how long this transition period will last, but we've seen the Magnificent Seven get bid up. And five out of the seven companies, six out of the seven companies have now reported. Um, and of course, some have done better than others, Microsoft, uh, Alphabet. How are you thinking about how big tech stacks up during this transition period to something that where we're just more comfortable with higher yields and higher inflation? So this is actually a fascinating case study because we talk to our clients all the time about concentration risk. Mm -hmm. And typically wealth, we're in the wealth management business and wealth is made through concentration and wealth is preserved through diversification. And in many ways, the S&P has the concentration risk, right? You've got the top seven, the top 10 names, which have driven most of the performance this year. And all you need is a faltering of or one or two of them to really bring the index down. And so that's what we're experiencing right now. I don't think the Q3 results were that bad to merit the sell-off that we had. Um, I do think overall the companies that don't need to finance themselves to grow will do better mm -hmm. and that includes large cap tech of the names we've seen already reported. I'm not completely concerned about it but I will say that in, if there are more falterings in the forward outlook you could have the S&P suffer more and we saw, we've, we've seen it, we saw it yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I mean today's the polar opposite in the Dow versus NASDAQ than what yes. we saw yesterday. Yeah. So. But, but again, the companies that don't have to finance themselves to grow mm -hmm. will do better. And that's large cap tech. Yeah. And that excludes probably like about, uh, you know, three quarters of the Russell 2000, unfortunately. Alicia, great to catch up with you. Maybe next time you're back, we can talk about uh, some of those uh, companies at the bottom of the barrel there that are up against some of those uh, financing deadlines. Alicia Levine, head of investment strategy and equity advisory solutions over at BNY Mellon Wealth Management here to kick us off to the close on a Friday afternoon with a look at Sam Bankman Fried taking the stand today in his own defense, denying that he defrauded anyone. The latest coming up in a bit. I feel like his hair is longer. 
than in that picture. In any case, we're also going to focus on the oil sector. ExxonMobil and Chevron posting disappointing profits on wheat performances by their oil refining and chemical businesses, but are all eyes on their big acquisitions. Halloween just around the corner, and we're learning that inflation is not spooking the consumer there. They're willing to pony up in order to celebrate. We'll break down exactly where consumer spending is shifting right now. That's coming up next on The Close. This is Bloomberg. season is here. Tons going on, lots of earnings. Beat, 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 wherever you look. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. It's a tale of two earnings. Results from Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, and Morgan Stanley. Netflix is out, guys. With exclusive expert analysis. Recovery is underway. They crushed it. It was one of their best quarters ever. This is a story all about pricing power. We're going to make more money. We're going to make more money. And we're going to make more money. We're making bank. And I think that, that is what we could take away. Bloomberg Television and Radio. Context changes everything. Turns out spending in the U.S. is speeding up, with the Fed's preferred measure of inflation jumping to a four-month high in September and consumer spending picking up as well. Let's now bring in Stuart Paul of Bloomberg Economics to help us take a look at the data and make sense of it. So the pace of core inflation, which backs out energy and food prices, did pick up during the month, but you point out that core goods prices fell. Explain how that works. So among the most important items that the Fed are looking at, that the Fed is looking at are core goods prices because some of those tend to be the most interest rate sensitive. We're talking about autos, we're talking about furniture and things that people might take out financing to, to purchase if they're going to end up remodeling their home, for example. And we did see those interest sensitive spending items have uh, price declines throughout the month of September. That is a little bit of a silver lining in the inflation report we were, where we did see an upside surprise and where, where we did see a little bit of an uptick in that core inflation print. Where are exactly, though, are the inflationary pressures coming from? They go into that meeting on Tuesday. The debate isn't just about whether they're going to raise rates again or, or even hold them again here. Right. Is there a, a sense here that that deflationary trend, that narrative that took hold here, that that's still in place? So the deflationary trend is evident in yeah. some of those things like core goods. Based on what we saw in 3Q GDP and what we saw in the advanced economic indicators yesterday, with inventories growing, you could expect, particularly retail inventories, you could expect that disinflationary impulse to continue. Where we are seeing some more additional inflation, where we did get that core pop, yeah. was in uh, core services. A lot of discretionary services spending categories in particular in September as people took that last, uh, that last uh, spending surge. But does the shift, though, in services spending versus uh, goods spending, does it move faster on the services side relative to goods? Does the spending the, 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 shift? Does the shift happen faster on the services side than the? It goods could side? be a little bit slower. Yeah. The shift, uh, the downshift in price pressures on the services side, because so much of the input to services prices are wages. But we're seeing relatively dull wage growth at just 20 basis yeah. points month on month for the past few months. Gotcha. All right. So of course, I just go back to the GDP report that we got earlier this week. 4.9 percent growth in the third quarter. How does that set up the Fed for what it does next? Given that consumer spending is driving that growth. GDP is pretty well backward looking. You know, we've already seen the retail data. We already saw the PCE data. And within that GDP print, about a third of that Q on Q growth comes from inventory accumulation. And when we look at PMIs, producers are saying that they're trying to rein in inventories. They're not trying to, to, to build up inventories and end up with excess stock if we end up seeing a, a waning demand uh, toward the end of the year and into Q1. So we have a little bit more of a morose outlook as we head into Q4. And we do think that uh, coming off of such a high base on spending, coming off such a high base on inventory accumulation, we're going to end up seeing a much slower Q4 than we just saw in Q3. All right, Stuart, great to catch up with you. Stuart Paul over at uh, Bloomberg Economics. A nice look here at some of the economic data as the Fed heads into its meeting on Tuesday and Wednesday. So, too, does the Bank of England. So, too, does the Bank of Japan. Bloomberg International Economics Policy correspondent Michael McKee joining us for more on what to expect, Mike. And let's uh, start off here with uh, Bank of England. I'll give you the easy gimme here. Uh, is there any con anything consequential going to come out of those folks? You know, I yeah. wouldn't have put that as the easiest one. Wow. Uh, that's one of the toughest uh, yeah. decisions 
decisions to be made because they still have an inflation problem. Inflation, CPI inflation is still going up there, but the economy is slowing, so it's a, a, a very difficult choice for them, and they are divided. They, they vote in a different way than other banks and announce their votes in a different way, so they can have a split vote, three mm -hmm. uh, different kinds of votes or four. Uh, so nobody really knows. The betting is strongly against them doing anything at this point in the markets, but it is always a possibility that they decide they need to do more. I like the fact that they can split their votes up, right? It yeah. shows diversity of opinion as opposed yeah. to everyone being forced to vote one way. Um, let's talk about the Bank of Japan. Yield curve control. Is there going to be some kind of tweak, adjustment, mention of it? Mention would do a lot f to make market participants uh, happy. That's where we're at, least, we're well, I'm talking about trading desks because of the volatility, not necessarily because they're going to like where rates go. But at this point, the heavy, heavy bet there is for no change. They're now looking at uh, CPI for the year at 2%, which is the third year in a row in which they've hit their inflation target. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it is maybe time for them to start thinking about changing their monetary policy, and they have uh, hinted at it, especially the idea of yield curve control ending at some point soon, yeah. but not yet. And of course, I mean, obviously, a lot of the obsession in the markets right now is among the on the FX side. Of course, uh, hitting that 150 mark here, I think we're all just a little bit above that right now, or below that, I should say, right now. Here, how much does that factor in to the decision? Well, it may put some pressure on, but central banks generally don't want to respond to currency fluctuations yeah. because of the second word there, fluctuations. They go up and they go down. Yeah. And you can't necessarily make yeah. a currency Although the yen's move. been going down. It's been yeah. going in one direction but for a pretty long But just because time, the yeah. central bank moves doesn't yeah. necessarily mean the currency yeah. is going to move in that yeah. direction. But they have let it be known that they could start raising rates before they get rid of yield curve control. So if they wanted to do something, in theory, they could, but the uh, market doesn't think that's going to happen at this meeting. Are you going over to Tokyo for this? Uh, no. Oh, I, okay. I, I, uh, did you want me to pick you up some Yeah, actually, lunch sure. or something? Yeah, a little like, dashi yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. More than lunch. Yeah. Everything's on sale yeah. there, given don't forget, for our dollar <laughs> trading. Don't forget the Norse. <laughs> the Norwegians are meeting as oh, well this week. So, okay. Uh, and they're not going to do anything either. Like just just want something. to make sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so the big three of us are depending on what you want to eat. And bring us back treats from all the major economies around the world. What would that? you bring back for us from Norway? From Norway? <laughs> yeah. oh, it's some sort of fish, I would think. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good. All right. Our thanks to Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent Mike McKee. Um, we joke about, you know, the Bank of Japan having a lot on its hands to yeah. deal with, whether it's yield curve control or the currency intervention, possible intervention. But it feels like currency market intervention is more of a political decision than it is it, a It's certainly a decision. little bit outside their purview. And I mean, but at the same time, though, when you look at the persistent weakness that you've seen this year and the idea that it's structural, I mean, mm -hmm. this isn't just, you know, I understand the idea what Mike's saying with when comes comes to currency fluctuations and the trading environment and how they have to kind of look beyond that. Yeah. But what we've seen in the yen this year is much more structural. And at some point, I would think they would have to address it. At some point, well, but I mean, I'm not a central banker. I'm also not a lawyer. <laughs> well, that's good because you know what's happening uh, in downtown Manhattan. What's that? Uh, Sam, Sam Bankman Bankman has rested his case. Uh, he oh. is testifying. He oh. took the stand today in his own defense. Is that is that advisable? Well, I mean, he did it. He denied that he defrauded anyone. He also blamed, I think, his lawyers, uh, you know, for not totally understanding what happened. But we're going to dig into all of that. That's next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, time to check in on the trial of Sam Bankman Fried, the FTX founder, taking the stand today in his own defense. He denied that he defrauded anyone, but he did acknowledge that customers were hurt. Joining us uh, right now is Angela Moon, who's been covering this uh, trial for us here at Bloomberg. And Angela, uh, this is interesting because, A, no one really thought he was going to take the stand in his own defense, but he also took the stand yesterday in his own defense, but there was no jury there. The judge just wanted to hear what his defense would be now we get to hear what he has to say before the jury. Is there a material difference between what he said today and what he told the judge yesterday? That's correct. And yesterday I was yeah. on, actually on this show talking about uh, this sort of unusual legal proceeding of him having to do like a dress rehearsal in front of 
uh, the judge before the jury. Um, and that was because the judge wanted to see if the case that he was trying to make was relevant at all and even worthy of the juror's time. And the ruling was that it wasn't. He wasn't able to uh, make a lot of uh, arguments that he made in front of the judge uh, yesterday. And the reason behind, in, uh, behind that was because the judge ruled that, you know, the legal presence that St. Beckman Fried's defense is mm -hmm. arguing, that he had all these, like, lawyers and legal counsel advising him on every decision-making uh, throughout the process, was actually irrelevant because it, it, there's a stark difference of, uh, of getting an advice mm -hmm. and just, you know, not following them are, are two very different things. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that makes the defense uh, case a lot weaker um, because he, they won't be able to use a lot of what he, they were trying to make yesterday. So how did he do today without being able to blame his lawyers for everything? I mean, he's doing better than yesterday, but remember, this is, we are now in the direct um, examination, and it's not cross. And even yesterday, he so seemed... So that's basically his own lawyers are basically correct, interviewing correct. him on the stand. Um, yeah. So he seemed to do pretty well yesterday, mm -hmm. too, it, but it was really until the cross where, you know, we saw that he was really kind of falling apart. Um, and this is exactly the reason why it is so risky for yeah. defendants to take stand in these, you know, very high-profile cases because it opens up the possibility a very hostile, you know, uh, cross-examination, which we're likely to see uh, next week as well. Did he have anything specific to say about Caroline Ellison and some of the folks who've already testified against him? Yeah, so I thought that was sort of the biggest takeaway from what we've seen so far is he was really trying to distance himself from Caroline Ellison and Gary Wang and some of his really close friends and confidence. And that's very different from their testimony, if you remember, from earlier in the trial, right? They were linking everything that they did to SBF and the fact that he knew everything and he orchestrated everything. He was kind of portraying himself as, you know, I was involved in high-level conversations, but mm -hmm. it I wasn't too deep enough to know what was really, really going on. And at what point he even said that he wasn't exactly sure about the, the, the funds, the customer funds moving from one entity to the other. That's like the classic CEO defense, right? I'm just above it all. I have no idea what I delegate going on everything below me. Yeah, yeah, the little people deal with that. I'm thinking big thoughts. Yeah. So what happens next week? We know that there's going to be cross-examination. How many more days is he on the stand? So we think the uh, cross-examination is going to be about two days. Um, it could start as early as, you know, this afternoon, but we're thinking maybe Tuesday, you know, things will wrap up and then the jury deliberation and we could really get a verdict uh, on this as early as late next week. Um, and we'll see then whether he was actually able to win over some jurors throughout his testimony. All right, Angela Moon, who covers this stuff for us uh, here at Bloomberg, the trial of the century, at least for uh, those folks here uh, right in our wheelhouse. And we should also point out, too, if you want to kind of look at kind of what got us to this point here, a great documentary produced by our team over at Bloomberg Originals, Ruin, the Sam Bankman-Fried story here. And you can watch that uh, wherever uh, you get your Bloomberg Originals on whatever streaming service uh, you have them, Scarlett. Have you, yeah. have you watched this I yet? did, yeah. And it did goes you? across the world, around the world. You yeah. know, we go to the Middle East, we yeah. go to Asia. We go to uh, the Bahamas, so yeah. it's a little bit of everything. And, and Silicon it, Valley, of course. Yeah, and this trial, I mean, obviously it's focused squarely on him and FTX, mm -hmm. but you kind of forget. I mean, the collapse of FTX took a lot of other people down. Yeah. With them. Not necessarily into a courtroom, but they certainly uh, are, are licking their wounds right Absolutely. Now. All right, we got a lot more coverage coming up here. Stick with us on The Close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close, almost 2.30 here in New York as we close out the week with additional volatility in the equity space. But that volatility really doesn't compare to what we're seeing in other asset classes out there, including in the Treasury space and in commodities. Abigail Doolittle is standing by right now with our commodities close. Abigail. Yeah, Romaine, we have some pretty decent volatility to the upside for uh, commodities today, that Bloomberg Commodity Index gaining. And you can see that New York crude WTI, it's having its best day in almost two weeks, up 2.7%. And some of this has to do with the Israel-Hamas uh, war and uh, the idea, the possibility that Israel may intensify uh, its efforts. So New York crude up 2.7%, still down on the week, though. Copper up 1.6%. Soybeans up 1.3%. Nothing too specific there. Sugar, 1.1%. 
uh, it seems like a rebound rally for a lot of these uh, commodities, and it's pretty much right across the board. Now, yesterday we were talking about orange juice. Orange juice is up for a seventh day in a row, a record high. It has to do with uh, supply, having to do with uh, disease and uh, weather. You can see this strong, strong uptrend here. If we were to put this into a longer-term trend, it would, or a longer-term chart, I should say, it would look like a parabolic uptrend. In fact, take a look at this. A double over uh, the last year. Carly Garner over at DeCarly Trading today posting that uh, she can't predict timing. Timing is always tough, but that whenever you have a parabolic uptrend, a bubble like this, that at some point, orange juice futures are probably going to be a short. All right, Abigail Doolittle with a nice wrap up there of what we're seeing in the commodity space. Meanwhile, we turn back to the global economy and particularly the second largest economy in the world, China. The death uh, that we learned earlier today about ex Premier Ali Kachung at the age of 68 from a heart attack just months after stepping down as the nation's number two official. Of course, Lee had gained a reputation as a reformer, uh, but later found himself sidelined uh, by President Xi. Meantime, China and the U.S. are holding working group meetings this week to try and iron out differences. Let's get some insights out of Amy Salico, principal over at the All Bike Group. Talk a little bit more here about the relations between the U.S. and China. And I do want to start off with the death of Lee here. There's been a lot of discussion here uh, about the role that he played really in a lot of the market reforms. And I think when we think about sort of the way that uh, China has sort of pivoted to, I guess, Western style uh, economic uh, open arms here, there are a lot of people that credit him as being a, a shepherd of that. Mm. Well, it really is a surprise that Premier Li passed away so suddenly of a heart attack, as you just said. And I think, unfortunately, uh, despite what you've said and all the work that he focused on in shepherding the economy over the past 10 years, he'll likely be remained as a pretty ineffectual premier because he was sidelined, uh, of course, by President Xi. Um, but indeed, he was somebody who focused on the economy, who had uh, a background that was focused on reform, certainly was a favorite of the prior president of China, Hu Jintao, who saw him as, as succeeding in continuing to open up China to the world. And so it really is a shock um, that Premier Li, only 68 years old, died of a heart attack suddenly. Uh, of course, uh, this comes against the backdrop as relations between the U.S. and China. At least there's an attempt to sort of improve those relations or at least to improve the dialogue uh, between the two countries. Uh, Wang Yi, the foreign minister of China, uh, meeting uh, today uh, with White House officials and I believe with uh, President Biden himself here. Uh, give us a sense here, I guess, of what these two sides are going to talk about and what they can actually offer each other that would give them a little bit more confidence about negotiations going forward. Well, it is very positive that um, that the foreign minister, Wang Yi, is here in Washington, has already met with President Biden in the White House, as well, of course, as Secretary Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. He is here talking to American counterparts about President Xi Jinping attending APEC next month. And so laying the groundwork for the first in-person meeting between President Biden and President Xi in a year, the last one was last November, on the sidelines of the, uh, the G20 meeting in Bali is very important. The relationship, as we all know, has only suffered more and more challenges over the past year. And so getting the two presidents together to talk about a way to manage competition, maybe more than solving problems, but ensuring that this very contentious and competitive relationship doesn't spiral out of control over one of many issues, uh, is really of critical importance. That's what uh, the foreign minister is doing here. That's certainly what Secretary Blinken, National Security Advisor Sullivan, are talking about with him, whether it's on economic uh, issues or political ones and the geopolitical tensions that continue to proliferate. And, of course, that's against the backdrop of a lot of big picture issues that the two need to address, one as a superpower and one as a rising superpower. You've got climate change, the Israel-Hamas war, uh, the war in Ukraine. Of those topics, is there one in which China and the U.S. Have, can find some common ground and kind of build from there? Well, clearly all three are difficult, but uh, for sure... Uh, the issue of climate change is one where we do think uh, that not only will they be talking about that topic this week, but Secretary Kerry, of course, the chief climate envoy, will certainly be having uh, meetings in California with his counterpart, the Chinese envoy for climate change. And so, Scarlett, as you said, the issues in Israel, 
uh, in Gaza, in Ukraine, are very difficult, clearly ones that the U.S. and China need to cooperate on. I'm sure they are talking about these issues today. Mm -hmm. But when you ask about where progress can be made, I do think the U.S. and China are committed together to continue to work on the climate issue. Another difficult one, but not laden with so many yeah. geopolitical issues as the other two. All right, well, let's go to the other extreme, which might be Taiwan in this case. Is that going to come mm. up at all, either in these preliminary discussions or between uh, Xi Jinping and Joe Biden? Of course it will come up. For the Chinese side, it is still the most difficult issue in the bilateral relationship. As the Chinese side says, the most contentious issue uh, where China has a very, very bright red line and doesn't want to see the United States backing off of its commitments to the one China policy. And so certainly the U.S. has something to say about this, too, with China increasing the number of flights, crossing the median line between uh, China and Taiwan. And so both sides need to talk about managing rising tensions there as well. It will clearly be a very important issue, not just while, while Wang Yi is here in Washington, mm -hmm. but for President Xi in talking with President Biden. All right, Amy, really appreciate your joining us. Amy Salico of the Albright Group, giving us a sense of what um, the two sides will be talking about when they do meet uh, formally in November, and by all indications, uh, that will happen. And, Romaine, I'm so glad you brought up Li Keqiang and his um, legacy, the, the fact that he's seen as this reformer. One thing that he did, which has really lived on, is he was kind of one of the first people to admit that China's GDP numbers are predetermined, to put it nicely, right? Like, they, yeah. they can come up with a number and then they'll meet it. Uh, so he liked to look at right. other metrics like uh, rail cargo volume, electricity use, and bank loans as proxies for growth. And that really changed how everyone looks at China and measures its economic progress. And we should point out, though, he was kind of led, I don't know if he specifically, but China was kind of led there, too. Because remember, this was a big issue. You go back to the 90s when China was really emerging and you mm -hmm. didn't have reliable data. It was kind of a, a joke, almost, mm -hmm. the GDP numbers. It was like, well, they could be whatever they want them to yeah. be. Yeah, And then so you started with a lot of people looking for that high frequency data or, yeah. or, or more reliable data. And he was one of the people who kind of said, you know what, we need to kind of lean into this a little bit more. I, I think, you know, I don't think you can under, understate his importance in terms of broadening out the economy, at least globally here. Yeah. And I know uh, President Xi now is kind of turning a lot more inward, so maybe that's why his influence waned over the last few years here. But I think when you look back at that trajectory from the 1990s through the early 2000s here, you see a stamp. Yeah, and I think it's something that we'll continue to see yeah. as we continue to talk about China and where it goes next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off here with Rivian, the electric automaker, getting raised to overweight over at Canner Fitzgerald. The analyst says the stock's underperformance over the last month actually makes a good entry point for those who are in it for the long term and don't mind a little volatility in between. He expects demand for Rivian vehicles to remain strong well into next year. The shares, which had been higher by almost 4%, given all that back and then some. Next up, let's take a look at Intel, an upgrade to hold from Reduce. This is over at HSBC, which cites the better-than-expected third-quarter results. Now, recovery in the PC market has proven to be instrumental for the chipmaker. That's what the analyst says. And while there is overhang from data center demand, the analyst says Intel's generative AI pipeline will continue to get stronger. Investors also seem to agree those shares having their best day in at least a year. And finally, let's take a look at Enphase Energy. Piper Sandler throwing in the towel after the company's guidance for the current quarter completely missed the mark. Piper cutting its recommendation to neutral from overweight, slashing its price target by about half to 75 bucks from 150 and says any hope for a return to growth in the near term is relatively low. Shares down 14% on the day, and those are some of our top calls. 
we do want to stay in the energy space, but well, I guess more traditional fossil fuel space. Some of the big oil firms, Chevron and Exxon, reporting earnings and I think a little bit of a disappointment for some investors who are also, of course, focused on those two big deals that each one of those companies are pursuing. Exxon CEO Darren Wood sat down with Bloomberg TV a little bit earlier to talk about the state of the sector. The industry is still recovering from the impact of the pandemic and uh, the lower levels of capital that have been going in across uh, the industry to, to offset the depletion that's been happening. And so supplies are fairly tight. And that was Darren Wood speaking earlier here on Bloomberg Television. Neil Dingman joining us right now. He's Truist Securities Analyst and he has a buy rating on Exxon and a hold on Chevron. And I do want to start off with Exxon here. I mean, they did have a miss uh, in the most recent uh, results, uh, Neil, uh, but it wasn't a huge miss. And obviously a lot more attention is being put on the big acquisition that they have to close and at some point digest. What you heard on the conference call, what you heard in the earnings release and what you heard in that interview, did it give you confidence that they're actually going to execute on that? Good afternoon, Romain. Um, the answer is simple. answer is yes. It does give me confidence. Um, you're right. The quarter itself was a little sloppy. I had much more concern on what I heard about Chevron's quarter, frankly, because of 10 geese and some, asset, you know, some, some delays there when I look at the two stocks. But again, Exxon, you look, earnings missed. Uh, CapEx was a little bit hot. There were just things that I think are a little transcendental that, um, again, I don't worry about to start 24. Uh, I think that acquisition of Pioneer, especially being an all-stock deal, I don't look at it being immediately creative, but I think it's going to ultimately be one of the best acquisitions we've seen in, in many years. Well, the market reaction today is a little bit more severe for Chevron, and some of that has to do not only with the results, but also the idea that what it's paying uh, or has agreed to pay for Hess, some people think that that might actually be a little bit too rich, at least relative to what Exxon's paying for uh, a Pioneer. That's right. I mean, they definitely paid, and, and you think about it, they're actually buying, when you, when, when you buy Hess, you're buying essentially what are you getting. Majority of that, of that company is, you know, is, is Guyana, which is operated by your, your major competitors. So it, it was a little bit odd. I mean, it just does help them diversify, but I agree with you. I thought the price they paid was a relatively steep price, uh, you know, where I mentioned that I think Exxon uh, might be a little bit dilutive for the next three or four quarters. I think Chevron could be dilutive for the next potentially six to seven, maybe even eight quarters mm. uh, on this deal. Again, depending how, how, how quickly Guyana r r ramps up because, you know, Unlike the Permian Basin over with Pioneer with Exxon, that is a short cycle business. Guyana, great field that's just going to take longer to ramp up. So that sounds like a bit of short term pain for shareholders when it comes to digesting those big acquisitions. Nevertheless, we've seen ExxonMobil increase its dividend one cent more than what Bloomberg had expected. And Chevron is also, according to Mike Worth, pledging to increase dividends and buybacks. Is that from where you sit the best use of their cash, the best way to keep shareholders on side? I, I, good, it's a good question, Charlie. I think the simple answer is yes, because uh, the, the balance sheet is very stellar. I mean, you don't want to, given how low their interest rates, you don't want to completely pay off your debt. And they're able to do a lot of these deals like this last one in equity. But what's interesting to me is they're paying out now the last couple, two, three quarters, well over 100% of their free cash flow is being paid out to support the combined dividend and share buyback. So to me, that's just a little bit aggressive. Um, you know, again, I'd rather see, like we see with a lot of the large independents who pay out 60, 70 percent of their free cash for each quarter. Uh, I'm all for shareholder return. I just think, again, you obviously, even if you're somebody with a stellar balance sheet like a Chevron, you can't continue to pay out 150 percent on a continuous basis of your free cash flow. All right, Neil, uh, great to catch up with you. Neil Dingman there over at Truist. Uh, closer look here at Exxon, Chevron, those earnings stocks on both of those uh, stocks lower here on the day. Meanwhile, Halloween is right around the corner and, well, inflation is still out there, but apparently it's not spooking the consumer. We're going to have that discussion coming up after the break on The Close on Bloomberg.
Let's focus now on the health of the consumer as we enter the scary season, also known as Halloween. A new report from LSEG finds that Halloween inflation not exactly spooky in the consumer. Joining us now with more on her findings is Sharon Martis, Director of Consumer Research at LSEG. Sharon, uh, thanks for joining us. And of course, we'll get to the health of the consumer overall as we head into the holiday season. It's never too early to talk about the holiday season. But um, as we approach Halloween, what have you observed in terms of consumers' willingness to spend, not just on things like candy, but on decorations and all the other things that go along with it? So, good afternoon. Um, we've had a stellar Halloween season last year, and so far, in a collaboration with Centric Pricing Intelligence, we found out that LSEC discovered that the um, Halloween sold-out rates for this year are on par with last year. This is telling us that consumers' willingness and demand for Halloween um, to celebrate the season is actually intact uh, and still robust, and we could have a healthy season. Having said that, what's interesting is that the costumes for Halloween, those that merchandise has gone up on sales significantly, so, mu so much more stronger than last year. Whereas the home decorations on the other side, those discounts and that amount of merchandise have actually come down um, in terms of being discounted. So what this is telling us is that retailers are being more strategic with mm. their discounting into the um, Halloween season. So they have apparel on sale and home decorations not so much in order to maintain those margins healthy. And what about your research on candy makers um, and the kinds of candy and how much we're paying for all that candy? Yeah, so cocoa prices, uh, a main ingredient to produce chocolate, those prices have actually gone up 64% compared to a year ago. And this is mainly because of dry weather in Western African countries, which is causing the supply to come down and as a result, prices to come up. So this could mean either one or two things. It can mean that either chocolate bars are gonna get a little bit smaller or that those prices are gonna be higher in order to pay for those chocolates. So far for the Halloween season, we're seeing that that demand is also intact. Those higher prices are not spooking out the consumer. In fact, both chocolate makers, uh, Hershey and Mondelez International are on track to see 14 consecutive quarters of positive revenue growth, yeah. suggesting that that demand is still intact. Well, can you put this in perspective for us too? I think a lot of people forget just how important the Halloween as a, uh, as a holiday is to the economy here. I mean, really the only thing that, that surpasses it is Christmas, I believe. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But what type of effect d uh, does that end up having for the retailers and the economy? Is it just kind of a short-term bump where, you know, they make a lot of money, but then that's not really gonna carry over into other sales, into other areas beyond Halloween? Actually, so far, uh, for the last three months, we've seen a very strong consumer. Uh, that's also the case in the month, this month in October. And when we look at the forecast for November and December, um, that still is on track to post um, very strong earnings. In fact, for the current quarter, we're looking at earnings growth for about 21% and revenue growth of 4%, which is actually stronger than the previous two quarters yeah. and underlines the resilience of the consumer. Now remember, last month for September retail sales, consumers went out and purchased cars, which underlines the willingness and resilience to pay big ticket prices. Uh, when we're seeing where they're shopping, you know, even Amber Combi, um, that's one teen retailer that's picking up a lot of demand. That's telling you that parents are feeling okay to paying $100 for a pair of jeans for their for their kids. So as of right now, the consumer is resilient. Now, having said that, the consumer is cautious, mm -hmm. but resilient. <laughs> cautious yet resilient. All right, Sharon Martis, I believe that's going to be a theme we're going to see throughout the next couple of months. Sharon is Director of Consumer Research at LSEG. And you know, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be dressing up as Taylor Swift for Halloween. She's now a member of the Three Comma Club. The Eras Tour has propelled the pop star into the very limited ranks of recording stars who have built a $1 billion fortune almost entirely from music. Bloomberg Originals has more on how her financial success was created. It's official. Taylor Swift is a billionaire. Welcome to the Eras Tour. Her Eras Tour alone is a party generating hundreds of millions of dollars. It's a multinational conglomerate with the world's most devoted customer base and an ultra charismatic CEO. Swift has made her fortune almost exclusively from her music. Bloomberg estimates Swift has made $125 million over the years from record sales. 
We estimate that her total income from streaming is $175 million. The biggest part of her earnings is undoubtedly her concert revenue. We estimate that Taylor nets about 35% of the ticket sales as profit, about $500 million from touring over the years. Her tours, her record sales, and streaming royalties are all earnings, but she also has assets, including her recording catalog. We estimate that her catalog is worth about $400 million. Then, of course, there's her actual property. That includes um, a condo and an estate in Nashville, an estate in Los Angeles, a large apartment in Tribeca in New York City, as well as a summer house in Rhode Island. The total value of her properties is about $110 million. Subtract her expenses, taxes, staff costs, and so on, and you get a net worth of $1.1 billion. And, you know, Bloomberg was fairly conservative when tallying up her assets as well, Romaine. And I think the thing that's most amazing is it's incredible that she did this in the era of streaming where artists don't get paid as much per download. Yeah, but also it kind of worked to her advantage, too, because the streaming era does kind of favor those folks who kind of are heavily sort of like the, the Magnificent scale. Seven, right? Yeah. Like it's those folks who are popular like her who can just kind of dominate everything. I mean, and my God, their whole catalog. I, mean, I, I mean, you walk into a retail store to get your Halloween candy, they're playing Taylor Swift songs there, all there. the time. Yeah. Are, so are you are you dressing up as Taylor Taylor Swift or Travis Kelsey? <laughs> um, I would have. I don't think I could go as Taylor Swift. I don't see there's there's no, not a natural. You can. You got to put your heart into it, Scarlett. Boo. And just you know, it, remember, being Taylor Swift, it's a state of mind. It's a state of mind, of course. I guess that means you're going as Taylor Swift. <laughs> I am, I, and it's going to be hard for me to fit into that leotard, but I'm going to try. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment. This is the close on Bloomberg. Almost 3 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top here in financial markets. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Scarlett Fu, and it's another Friday, Romaine, and we're seeing some people not willing to take on a lot of risk before the weekend. Yeah, and they really haven't had a whole lot of reason to do so. Remember, if, uh, if the earnings season was supposed to be the sal for this market, mm -hmm. it certainly didn't really apply uh, this week here. Some big disappointments from some of the big names, and of course, a break below the 4,200 level for the S&P 500, a break below that 200-day moving average on the NASDAQ. And take a look at the stock's uh, success. Europe too, because we should point out this is a global issue yeah. right now here. Uh, they're about a 1% away from erasing all of their gains uh, from uh, 2023 here. Uh, so uh, down eight tenths of a percent on the day, but you get another 1% drop here and they're basically flatline on a year to day basis. The sentiment has definitely soured since the start of earnings season just by the most uh, superficial of ways of looking at it. 10 trading days since JP Morgan announced results. The S&P fell on eight of those trading days. Yeah, a flip up the board too, because I want to talk, get to this idea here of sort of what is actually left for investors to buy. If you're not getting the earnings, if you don't have confidence in the economy, and of course, you know, the yields are batting things around, well, what do you do? You're not getting uh, earnings premium, and guess what? That chart is telling you you're not giving a dividend yield premium yeah. either, at least relative to, once again, what you can get in the Treasury space. Pick your point on the curve, short end, long end. You'll actually make more money on a risk-adjusted basis in those areas than in risk assets. Especially when the 10-year yield hit 5% like it did earlier this week. It didn't stay there, but that certainly brought a lot of buyers in. I want to talk about a couple of movers here as we look at uh, some of the big uh, movers heading into the close. And it goes beyond the Amazons and the Intels. Dexcom was the best performer mm. in the Nasdaq 100 and the S&P 500. Yeah. You know how much it's fallen since mid-July when the Ozempic effect really became a big thing? No, how much? Almost half of its market value, Yeah. 45%. But it delivered a beaten raise quarter along yeah. with a $500 million stock buyback program. And, and now everyone's saying, oh, those fears were overblown. Right. And this is, a, they make glucose monitors. Yes. And they're basically saying, look, people are still going to use these. I mean, this is a medical device. And even if you're getting some benefit off of these uh, weight loss drugs, the, the idea There's is that still you would still there. need to monitor. Yeah. yeah. There's still definitely a market yeah. there. All right. And let's also talk about solar equipment makers. Enphase, uh, the worst performer in the S&P 500, also dragging down the solar sector. Uh, the TAN ETF is down 4%. A substantial drop in U.S. and European demand that won't recover until the second half of next year. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I understand the sell-off, but this seems to be a little bit overdone, if you will, here. I mean, we talk about, what is it, 14% or whatever we're getting. And, of course, remember, it was down significantly yeah. earlier in the week.
Yeah. Uh, and, and what else did you have? Do you have anything uh, uplifting on that on that chart? Of I yours? do. Let's yeah. do Deckers. Okay. I, I I don't know if you Deckers. buy Uggs or That's Uggs. Uggs, yes. Okay. Those boots. I don't. Uh, or if you have them in your household, uh, they rallied as that much as twenty percent. That would go with Taylor Swift costume. <laughs> yes, it yeah. would. Um, for the July, August, September quarter, summer in the U.S., where it gets two thirds of its revenue, sales of Uggs jumped twenty eight percent. Who's buying Uggs in the middle of summer? <laughs> that's my question. Is that a rhetorical question? I don't, maybe it's spend... back to school shopping gone wild. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a, one of the big movers uh, here uh, on the day here. I guess a bright spot in the economy as we move uh, one hour away from those closing bells. Our cross-platform coverage starts right now. Come down to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're joined right now by our colleagues Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic, fresh off their two-day vacation. Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg Wait platforms, television, radio. I can't hear you, Carol. I'm still doing the intro here. And, of course, Bloomberg Originals and our partnership with YouTube. Carol Masser. Uh, you missed a lot the last two days while you guys were uh, on vacation here. Uh, but we talk about a market that really has had trouble finding any sort of direction. Actually, we yeah. were in the perfect place to talk about this market that's oh. uh, having a tough time finding direction. We were at Schwab Impact 2023. Mm. It was all investment advisors, registered investment advisors, the top uh, voices from Schwab trying to assess where we go from here. Uh, some interesting conversations, uh, including maybe it's time to look overseas rather than the U.S. markets. Having said that, we want to focus on the U.S. market because we've got two billionaires to talk about. I saw you guys talking a little bit about uh, one of them earlier. But Jamie Dimon, moving shares of J.P. Morgan, they are down, uh, really underperforming in today's session. They're down about 3.8 percent. On news that he plans to sell um, and did an SEC filing on selling one million shares of J.P. Morgan, we're talking about $141 million. It's his first stock sale during his tenure, almost nearly 18 years at the helm of J.P. Morgan. Kind of interesting, said to be financial diversification, tax planning purposes. First thing that popped into my head, and apparently <laughs> Mike Mayo thinking the same thing, it's a well, reminder that, you know, he is getting close to retirement. Uh, yeah, I think that was the first thing that popped right? into everyone's head is, is this now the exit plan? Are you plan? saying I'm a commoner in thinking? No, I'm not. Felt I'm not that saying way. you're a commoner here. But I also I was also fascinated by the idea that he had never had a share sale yeah, uh, during too. his tenure. Yeah, and But I guess, you know, when you think about the value of compounding, you think about the share performance that, that, that this company has had uh, over the last, you know, 15 years. Did you see what home. he's Did worth? Two billion dollars. Yes, I saw what it's worth. Well, look I at the return of J.P. Morgan it, shares Did I? over over his tenure at the helm. Okay, uh, it's an increase of almost 250 percent, more than 10 times the gain of the S&P 500. And then you have to go back to 2009 in the wake of the financial crisis, Romain. Mm -hmm. He bought 500,000 shares. This was a sign of confidence. He did the same thing back in 2016. He spent mm -hmm. about 38 million dollars doing that. Now he's uh, selling some stock. But it's a reminder of how leveraged he was to J.P. Morgan. He was yeah. long to J.P. Morgan in every way, right? Through his salary, through his job, uh, and of course through well, all this exposure through equity. Don't you really, you know, you think about it, he's the only, he's the lone CEO standing from the yeah. financial crisis. So during that time coming out, going through the crisis, coming out of it, he probably had to be very sensitive to show any signs of kind of bailing on the company. I yeah. mean, it really was a sign of endorsement, a big sign of endorsement. There's never a good time, right? No. Well, remember, but remember that it was like, I don't know, I I can't remember uh, what a quarter it was, but I remember a few years ago uh, they, uh, when the share price had sort of taken a hit and uh, he was asked on a conference call here whether he was still buying shares and he was like all day, every day. <laughs> and, you know, but I mean, he has always been a big champion uh, of the company, obviously, as you would want to be as a CEO. But but really, any time there were those criticisms, this idea here that maybe, uh, uh, you know, the stock wasn't worth what it was, he always made a show of making sure that uh, – the public understood that he thought it was still a buy. The ultimate well, insider, yeah. right, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Jamie Dimon, billionaire, Taylor Swift, billionaire. For everyone else, and let's talk about uh, <laughs> baby boomers versus millennials. I mean, um, Jamie Dimon versus Taylor Swift, right? <laughs> yeah, kind of makes perfect. sense. I want to put them together to talk money. I just would love to do that. that. That's a great way of framing this, Tim, because there's a great call from Bank of America that says if you're going to look at demographics and consumer spending patterns, you want to go long what baby boomers buy and you want to short what millennials are buying because millennials have less disposable income at their reach, especially with the resumption of student loan payments and just the pressure. They A lot of them don't own homes, and if they do want to, they're paying exorbitant fees uh, and mortgage rates for it. So if you're thinking Romaine by health care and entertainment, if you're thinking Tim, <laughs> yeah. maybe you do uh, some different things. You sell clothing retailers? Yeah, that's what, at least that's what, you know, Bank of America is saying. I will say you have to exclude Taylor Swift from this conversation I, because she owns a lot of real estate. Bloomberg yeah. 
puts it, that value at $110 million. I'm confused. Did Carol just insult me? <laughs> I, I, it went over my head. You know. Did she think you were a boomer? Out. I, I mean, I know. I mean, I'm so much younger than her, so I, I, I can't, you know. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> Actually, I, I think we're all Gen with, X, in which so. case no one pays attention to us. <laughs> I say so. nothing. I'm going to say I've seen the real estate, uh, the Rhode Island real estate that Taylor Swift has. It is gorgeous. Okay. Really You've beautiful. been there? You got invited? Did she I've taken you? pictures. Yeah. I've done a little selfie no. with my daughter. You're Swifty. You Security <laughs> escorted totally her away, a but Carol. she still got the picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to be back. We're going to wrap up this day of trading and, of course, the week of trading. We're going to be back in less than an hour's time. Our cross-platform radio, TV, YouTube, and, of course, Bloomberg Originals. Join us for Beyond the Bell at 4 p.m. Wall Street time. We continue our coverage here on The Close, counting you down to those bells, which are just about 50 minutes away. And our next guest, well, he is Wall Street's biggest bull. Oppenheimer's John Stoltzfus saying a little bit earlier that we do think that things are actually getting better, even though interest rates are higher. Pleased to say that John joins us right now to talk a little bit more here about what's going on in the market. And John, this is a market that I think has defied a lot of expectations this year, as I'm sure you know. I mean, we came into this year with the expectations of a big drawdown, with expectations of a potential recession. At least for now, that's been averted. But the big question is, what's the momentum now going into 2024? What's there that's going to propel this market higher? Well, uh, thanks for having me on the show, Romain. Great to be on, on Bloomberg TV any time of day. Uh, one thing to say here is, is we think what we're experiencing really in the current uh, turmoil in the market near term is simply the fact that uh, the Fed is orchestrating the end of free money. Uh, and we think it's a good thing because it means that uh, bond issuers have to pay for the privilege of borrowing money after for almost 15 years, for most of that time, uh, uh, whether it was the Fed funds rate or uh, fiscal stimulus that was added, took us to a level where really we were pretty much at free money. Just the Fed uh, funds uh, rate was uh, in a band from zero to zero point two five for much of that time, and now we're at five and a quarter to five and a half. Mm -hmm. I couldn't help but think, uh, you know, you have to take into consideration that the current period to uh, a millennial looks really terrible in terms of an eight percent mortgage. Uh, as somebody who's been in the markets for 40 years and I'm a baby boomer, I had a 10% mortgage as my first <laughs> mortgage, and I would have signed up for life for 8%. I can remember when the Federal Reserve actually had a target of 4% inflation mm -hmm. as a goal. Uh, you know, I've been through Volcker, uh, uh, Greenspan, yeah. and then, of course, the wonderful period of, of Bernanke and the Bernanke legacy that follows through with Yellen and yeah. Powell. And that's proving to have been somewhat of an anomaly. But I think it's interesting you point out yeah. about the performance of the market and the economy, for that matter, when we had a much higher interest rate environment. And, and anyone could just pull up sure. a chart on Bloomberg. And you can see that, you know, when we were last sure. in a 5% sure. world, stocks did pretty well. When we were last, for quite frankly, Frankly, in the 8% okay. wor world, a stock still did pretty well here. Why, why do you think everyone is so, I guess, skittish now? Is it just the generational gap that you have a lot of people in this market that just weren't alive to see what 5% really meant? I think it, in part it most certainly is it, true. And thank you for reading the report because that, that detail that you just quoted is, is worthwhile mentioning, you know, that much higher rates did not mean underperformance of equities, even versus fixed income for a large part of those years from 1971 to, to uh, 1989, when inflation was a lot higher or a challenge to the Fed, even as it came down. Uh, we, you know, we'd have to say right now, we think it, it's generational. There, there's an issue there, uh, interest rate shock. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, my boss's uh, first mortgage was 16%. And in our survey of, of clients, we've run into people with 18 percent mortgages, and we all survived this stuff. And uh, some refinanced, some paid off mortgages at a higher rate, and it worked out pretty good. Past performance, no guarantee of future results. But we do think, you know, if we look at the, the economy, we look at revenue growth uh, 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 within the S&P 500 mm -hmm. uh, during the current earnings season, Q3, as well as profitability, uh, it's remarkable how resilient uh, companies mm -hmm. uh, have been, corporations have been, how the uh, the uh, the uh, shopper or the consumer has been, yeah. as well as really uh, how good uh, overall labor has been. If you consider there's about one and a half jobs for any uh, every unemployed person, sure. it's pretty extraordinary. I think it reflects a Federal Reserve that has been much more sensitive in practicing its mandate 
in bringing down untoward levels of inflation that we've reached as a result of too much fiscal policy stimulation and plenty of stimulation in terms of liquidity from the Fed. But during two pieces, two periods of back-to-back -back crises. Yeah. And certainly you could argue that it's guided the economy well. So how then, John, do you read this current pullback in equities where we have the S&P 500 entering a correction, the Nasdaq 100 entering a correction, down 10 percent from their recent highs? How do you read that? Sure. Well, first thing is I'll put it in context. Uh, you know, on a year-to-date basis, communication services, which is about 50 percent tech, uh, based on my SPXL1 uh, GRR screen on Bloomberg, is still up 33.2 percent with the S&P year to date, with the S&P 500 just up about 6.94 percent. Information technology is up 30.9 percent, and consumer discretionary is up 17.53. The rest of the sectors are off to varying degrees. But what it shows me is that, if anything, this is likely uh, a haircut that is happening to the market, or a correction now at this point, mm -hmm. that is simply relative to a period of, of the Fed having said higher for longer, which indeed may just mean high for longer relative to the rates that we've experienced over the last 15 years. Okay. So that, uh, you know, a Treasury, a 10-year at, at 45 to 5%, is uh, quite normal pre uh, financial crisis and and uh, and pandemic over the longer term of history. Right, longer term normalization. So, John, where does that leave your forecast for the S and P five hundred? Uh -huh. I know you have a price target of forty nine hundred, and in part that was because your previous forecast was forty four hundred, and the S and P did get to that at the end of the first right. half. So, when that happens, you yep. raise your target once again. What would prompt you to reduce that target now, given that we're below forty two hundred? Uh, well, well, I would say right now, you know, when we put that target in at 4,900, it would impl would have implied only about 6% upside to the end of the year. Now it would uh, 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 give us a 18% upside. We'd have to have a heck of a lot of good news coming in, but we've had enough bad news that you never know what could happen between now and then. That said, quite frankly, our target is under review at this point, but mm. it still stands as of now because I, I can't tell you whether I'm going to raise it, keep it the same, or lower it before we actually finish our, 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 our conversation within it. But we would expect that the, the S&P will end this year higher than where it is now uh, based on the fact that uh, we really are, are seeing a, a positive effect of the Federal Reserve's actions against inflation and relative resilience in corporate earnings and revenue growth, uh, as well as uh, the consumer performing well and labor uh, uh, in, in good stead, even as the economy slows. Mm -hmm. But the Fed remains highly sensitive to the effects of its mandate at this period. I, I think that you know, Jerome Powell does not want to take us into a recession. He also doesn't want to be remembered uh, as Arthur Burns, yeah. and and I think who failed to battle inflation and, and didn't do it uh, effectively, so it had a great resurgence that had to be dealt with sure. draconially. Uh, it, it was dr draconian measures by Volcker. That's not the case here, sure. from what we see. Right. I mean, that's a shadow that looms over every Fed chief. John, thank you so much. John Stolfus is chief investment strategist over at Oppenheimer Asset Management, and of course, uh, as we take a look at what's coming up. Pharmacists at Walgreens and CVS are planning walkouts next week. So the summer of strikes has extended into the autumn of strikes. We're going to take a look at what they're trying to accomplish. Plus, to push ahead here to the biggest daddy of them all, Apple set to report earnings next week. Apple also planning to announce new iMacs and MacBook Pros next week as well. A full breakdown here of what to expect. And for all the talk of a strong labor market, there's an apparent increase in what's called ghost jobs that employers never seem to intend to want to fill. What is driving that trend? We're going to discuss all that and more. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for our Options Insight segment. Abigail Doolittle joining us uh, as she does every day around this time. And Abigail, you're taking a look once again at some of the parallels between the current environment 
And should I say this out loud, 1987, what's going on? Well, you know, we passed that date in October, so I guess we're a little bit safer. But indeed, because we are looking at uh, high rates, higher for longer. And up until just a couple of months ago, stocks had been super high, too. So let's talk about this once again with Steve Sosnick, chief market uh, strategist over at Interactive Brokers. Great to have you back on this. And you first raised this topic uh, with us here on Options Insight on Bloomberg Television back in August, so well ahead of other people talking about it. And I think it was the trajectory of rates going how fast they were going higher and that's just not sustainable for stocks and other risk assets to continue to go higher as well. That, that was yes that was my premise and thank you because I, I do think we talked about it before before people did um, but you know it reminded me of 1987 because in 1987 you had this huge upward trajectory in interest rates um, you know it was a huge bear market in bonds and then you know sometime around August you know stocks of course were going crazy um, sometime around August, that started to change a little bit, August of 87, and that's kind of what made me think about it in August of this year, was we started to see people move money out of, out of stocks into bonds. And, you know, of course, it spiraled out of control back then. And I know Romain didn't want to jinx it by bringing it up. And I, I, I'm not going to go, you know, I'm not calling for, you know, a cataclysm. But, uh, but my point was that the rotation was inevitable. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing now. Well, you were kind enough to make the chart that we're looking at right here for us back uh, at that time. And you can really see the parallels. And while we might not have had a total like one or two day spin out, uh, we do have the Russell 2000 almost in a bear market, something that's not being talked a ton about. The uh, Nasdaq 100 officially in the correction, the S&P 500 joining that territory today. Do you think that this selling continues? And it's interesting because at another segment that we had recently, you were bringing the Magnificent Seven in saying way too much waiting to those. And I I know a lot of yeah. you know people yeah. are talking about that, but look at this earnings season in the micro. That's we are seeing a bit of a dent there. Well, as a technician, you know that we like to see broad market advances, and that wasn't what we were seeing. We were. I'm oversimplifying by saying it was seven of one and 493 of the other in the S&P 500, but to a certain extent, that's the case. Why do we like broad market advances? Because it ex because a narrow market exposes you to to this to the type of downdraft that we're seeing now. If if the consensus is to be fully weighted or overweighted in a narrow group of stocks, what happens if someone wants to sell them? Who do you sell them to if, everybody's already, if everybody already has what they need? And of course, that can spiral out of control. That, I wouldn't say we've spiraled out of control, but that's the reason why, these, you know, why we're seeing this pullback now. The other problem is these indices became so top heavy. Forty mm percent, -hmm. it's, you know, seven stocks are over 40 percent of NDX and about a quarter of, of SPX. If they go down, it's gravity. They take everything with them. And in about 30 seconds or so, Steve, the VIX, it is back above 20. It's waking up. But yet relative to, you just used the word spiraling down, you know, relative to that kind of environment, you would think it would be a little bit higher. What's the main reason volatility is suppressed or two reasons? There have been three reasons all year. <laughs> one, one was complacency. and I think we've got rid of the complacency. Mm -hmm. Number two is dispersion. We still have seen, you know, if you're talking about some stocks, seven stocks go up and the rest go down and score to 50-50, that does dampen VIX. And the third reason is um, you've had a lot of products come out that involve selling volatility. So there have been institutional sellers of volatility, not only through you know, just general funds, funds positioning themselves, right. but also series of ETFs and things of that nature that, that involve volatility selling. That puts, a, that puts a lid on, uh, somebody's got to buy it, and that puts a lid on the VIX and other Great things. Great perspective, as always, and hope to have the conversation with you again, but yet not with a true crash. Exactly. Steve Sosnick of Interactive <laughs> Brokers, thanks so much for joining us today for Options Insight. And from New York, this is Bloomberg. For all the data that show the U.S. job market is super strong, it often doesn't feel that way when you're unemployed and job hunting. It's actually pretty exhausting in that different websites allow people to mass apply for open positions. Bloomberg spoke to one applicant, Romain, who has a weekly quota of filling out 75 to 100 applications and has applied to 500 jobs in total. And the rub here is that no one ever responds to him. Yeah, I love this story. This was actually the first story I read on the Bloomberg terminal this morning. And we all know that, that kind of the hiring process has been kind of fraught, the application process. You basically submit into these uh, websites. And, and yeah, you have no idea whether anyone's looking. He's kind of taking the same approach. He's basically saying, okay, I'm just going to find a way to kind of automate this, if you will, yeah. here. And there's a great quote in the story that says, like, have my computer call your computer. And at some point, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll actually sort things out here. But I wonder, it gets to the idea 
idea is how reliable are some of this job openings data and some of these other metrics that we talk about so much? If there are really truly that many jobs out there, why does this guy need to submit 500 applications? Exactly. So maybe those jobs don't actually exist. Yes. Or maybe HR is putting there because they need to fill it another way and they have to say that they posted it. They wouldn't do that. Sarah, no, would no. That never happens, right? <laughs> A lot more coverage coming up here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. About 30 minutes left to go here in the trading day. Scarlett, and of course, in the weekend, has not been a good week. No, another yeah. day, another decline. And in fact, the S&P 500 is setting up for a second straight week of losses of about 2.5% for the week. Right now, you have a lot of red on the screen here when it comes to the sector performances. You've got eight out of 11 groups uh, falling right now, led by energy and financials. But when you look at the S&P, it's only off by about half of 1%. And that's because the sectors that are green are consumer discretionary, information technology and communication services, also known as the Magnificent Seven. Most of those names, with the exception of Alphabet, are higher, and so that is limiting the losses in the benchmark index remain. And that includes Amazon, which is having a really good day, up about 7%. But just a reminder, of course, while Amazon is a big heavyweight, it's not as heavy as some of those other names, and that's a big part of the reason why the S&P is still kind of straddling the line between gains and losses on the day. But if you're an Amazon investor, uh, count yourself fortunate here on the day. Another bright spot on the day is AutoNation, though it's giving up some of the gains on the day. Uh, this is the, one of the biggest uh, used car dealerships in the U.S. Uh, and they actually reported some relatively good earnings here. Remember, there was a lot of concerns about the uh, car dealership space and whether that would hold up in the face of higher interest rates. And really just the idea that car prices uh, in and of themselves, even uh, taking out the financing, are actually still well elevated here. But the guidance they gave was very encouraging here. Meanwhile, in the middle, two concerns here. Chevron down 7% on the back of its earnings. A lot of concerns about the cost to digest uh, its acquisition. And Home Depot shares only down seven tenths of a percent, but that's the ninth straight day of declines here, Scarlett. Nine straight days, and we haven't seen a daily losing streak on Home Depot like that since early 2007 when the housing market began to blow up. Yeah, pretty incredible and speaks to how maybe uh, consumers are a little reluctant to pay up for big ticket items right now. We want to move uh, over to taking a look at what's going on in the labor market, in particular, organized labor. In an effort to demand better working conditions, you have pharmacists at Walgreens and CVS planning to walk off the job early next week. Former Walgreens employee Shane Jerome Jerminski is one of the many who's spearheading the strikes. Shane is now serving as an independent pharmacist after a career where he worked at Walgreens, then Target and CVS. And Shane joins us now. Shane, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Give us a sense of what you and other pharmacists are looking to achieve by walking off the job. Yeah, so the main concern for pharmacists is not their rates of pay, but the ability to be able to be insured hours for technicians and to have better working conditions across the board and pay for technicians. Our technicians are the backbone of every pharmacy. When you walk into a store, you might see six people behind the counter, if you're lucky, if you're in a well-staffed store. That's not the case all the time. But most of those people behind the counter are technicians, and they're making just as much as fast food employees in most places. So in order to retain that top talent, we really need to have technicians have a better rate of pay. Yeah, I, I think six is pretty generous. Usually I see maybe one person who's overworked. Can you describe, Shane, what a typical day looks like for a pharmacist, a, pharma, a technician at Walgreens versus, say, five years ago? Sure. So five years ago, there was a flu shot season, and then there was a ramping up during that time where we'd be giving vaccinations. But right now, Walgreens and CVS are just in love with that margin associated with vaccinations. And since COVID, it's really ramped up, that there's no longer a flu shot season, that we've become vaccination clinics who also happen to fill prescriptions in their spare time. So technicians are there trying to get those prescriptions out the door, but at the same time, processing vaccinations, working with insurance companies to make sure that things are covered. Uh, all of this while answering the phones and doing all these other tasks that help with the margins for Walgreens and CVS, but don't really they're not focused on the two things that we're supposed to be doing, giving vaccinations and safely and accurately checking prescriptions for patients. Uh, is there a sense here, uh, Shane, when we talk about kind of what the pharmaceutical uh, industry is sort of involved into, I mean, the pharmacists, I should say, uh, industry has sort of evolved into with some of those issues that you just talked about. Is there any sort of uh, sense here that if 
uh, this continues to move in the direction that that maybe ends up bolstering the independent pharmacists in a way uh, that they actually kind of reassert the role that, quite frankly, they had in most of our lives a couple of decades ago and beyond. Sure, I would say that that would be absolutely correct. Most people fall in love with the, the model once they walk into an independent pharmacy. You know, pharmacists were at one time the most accessible healthcare professional available. And you knew your pharmacist sometimes better than you knew your doctor. And they will fall in love with the idea of working in an independent, going into an independent pharmacy and having that feel where it's really patient first. Mm -hmm. But independent pharmacies are really struggling because of the insurance reimbursements right now. Pharmacy benefits managers have hamstrung a lot of independent pharmacies and they're, they're a dying profession and I'm sad to see that. So pharmacy has a lot of problems right now, but reimbursement is definitely involved in that. And if we don't have PBM reform, you will not have independent pharmacies a decade from now. It seems like you're kind of pushing up against a stone here. I mean, as I'm sure you know, these are structural changes that go far beyond just Walgreens and CVS and the like here. This also has to do with regulation and legislation that has sort of allowed these companies to sort of uh, blow up and prosper in the way that they have here. So if this is the new normal, meaning uh, the big PBM model here, uh, how do you, uh, as, a, in, as a pharmacist, and for, and for that matter, your peers, particularly those that are looking to unionize here, is there any any hope that they'll be able to sort of make those gains uh, on uh, getting better working conditions and pay? Well, yeah, this this what's coming up in the next week, Farmageddon is what they're dubbing it, is really the flashpoint was Kansas City, the Kansas City walkouts that occurred last month. Uh, 24 CVS pharmacies within the Target channel in Kansas City uh, got together and they were really upset because Target is, is the lowliest of the low in CVS because they're, they have a smaller amount of prescription volume. So they're last on the list of, of, of priorities for a company like CVS. And they even though those stores are open for 64 hours, they've, been ta they've only been given 20 hours of technician help. So essentially, that's the pharmacist by themselves. That six number that I threw out at the beginning is way, way out of range for those Target pharmacies. They were actually operating with just a pharmacist behind the counter for most of the time that they're open. And even if you're doing 100 or 150 prescriptions, you have to remember you might have 100 vaccination appointments uh, as well. So anyone can be overwhelmed with that amount, of, uh, that amount of work. That's like running a McDonald's by yourself, except for the cheeseburgers can kill you. Gotcha. So let me just understand correctly, Shane, more pay from the likes of Walgreens and CVS won't change your mind. That's not what's at issue here, is it? If they were to increase your pay, say by double digits, would, would the workload and the pace be enough, be, be okay? No, that's, I think if you ask any pharmacist in America right now, would they rather $5 an hour in their wage or would they rather an extra technician behind the, behind the counter to help? They would almost unanimously vote for an extra technician. This is about safely practicing. The disparity between what's in, at stake for Walgreens and CVS if a medication er error occurs and what's at stake for a pharmacist or the pharmacy manager who's ultimately responsible for every prescription that goes out, they risk so much more. They could lose their license. They could be on probation with the Board of Pharmacy. Mm -hmm. They could have a hefty fine that's imposed on themselves. If Walgreens uh, has a medication error happen, and the only way they have to that these are even investigated because there, there's no regulation that they have to report this to the boards of pharmacy in their state is when a, t when a patient reports it to the board I and see. then an investigation occurs. So when an investigation occurs, CVS might get a $10,000 fine, but you tell me who has more, more to risk. Yeah, and I mean, by that time, it's too late. You don't want that to have to happen. Shane, really appreciate your joining us today. Share, Shane Jeremonski is an independent pharmacist. He's also the spearheader of the nationwide pharmacist strikes that are set to begin on October 30th. Coming up on the close, Apple is set for its scary fast product launch on Monday. This is our stock of the hour. Apple currently up about half of 1%. We'll discuss all that it's going to unveil next. This is the close. I'm All right, time now for our stock of the hour, a focus on Apple, which is expected to release new MacBook Pro laptops and iMac desktops at a launch event on Monday. They're set to include new, faster M3 chips, and we should also point out Apple is also scheduled to report earnings later in the week. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman joining us right now with a little bit more detail on this latest product launch. Uh, and Mark, kind of just kind of help me catch up here because I thought they had some big splashy product launch where they announced the new iPhones. What is this product launch and why was it not connected to the last one? 
Yeah, so typically they like to split their product launches in the fall in two. In September, they have one focused around the iPhone, the AirPods, and the Apple Watch. And then usually between mid and late October, sometimes in early November, they have a product launch that's all around the Mac and the iPad. There's no new iPads to announce the, this fall. Those will come in the spring, I'm told. So there's going to be a Mac-focused one Monday evening. Now, on the docket there, the M3 chip, that's going to be the company's first uh, three nanometer Mac processor. That's a very big deal. More efficiency, higher speeds. TSMC in Taiwan is making these. It's a, it's a big story, a big situation for Apple. And then there's going to be a new iMac. That's the all-in-one desktop, the very mm. thin, very colorful all-in-one. First update to that machine in over 900 days. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be new MacBook Pro. So the yeah. MacBook Pros are going to be refreshed for the second time this year with those new processes. Uh, how important are these products to Apple's uh, sales and their bottom line? I mean, they are reporting earnings uh, later in the week here, and I know we probably won't get too much of a read out of this product launch in that earnings report. But at some point, people want to know, I mean, what's that business like? Is it healthy? The Mac business I'm talking about. The Mac business is healthy, right? The Mac business uh, is not as healthy as it was a year ago, right? A couple of years ago, this was a $10 billion a quarter business. Now we're down to about between six and seven billion. It's still a nice increase from the days of where it was perpetually at a four to $5 billion business. So they have still held up a little bit. Last quarter, they, they dropped actually 7% on an annual basis. This quarter, they're gonna drop more than 10%. Mm. And the company is hoping, of course, that these two new Macs will uh, rise uh, the overall uh, earnings for, for the Mac revenue for the first quarter, the holiday quarter, they'll announce at the end of January, early February. Now, each of these Macs, they're not their highest volume sellers. I mean, combined, they probably generate four to four billion a quarter for Apple. The iMac is probably a one to two billion dollar a quarter business. The Mac Pro is probably a three to four billion dollar a quarter business. Uh, so they're not their hottest sellers, but they're two of their most important computers. And two very interesting items to call out here. This year yeah. is the 25 year anniversary of the iMac, so it's important they have a new one for that. And in January, believe it or not, it's gonna be the 40 year anniversary of the Mac in general. So wow. it's a big deal. Okay. That's that's the one where you had to like scroll off to the side to see a whole like sheet of paper or something. I, feel, I don't know, I think Mark's too young to remember that. I, I, I was just gonna say, I feel really, really old right <laughs> yeah. now. Mark, um, talk a little bit about the other product that they're refreshing very quickly here, which is the AirPods, where the growth rate is rising and is becoming a more and more important product. Full revamp, overhaul of the AirPods. Next year, two new low-end models, one with noise cancellation. 2025, you'll have new redesigned AirPods Pros. And at the end of next year, you'll also have updated AirPods Max headphones. They'll be moving from Lightning to USB-C to match that new connector on the latest iPhones. All right, I think Scarlett's definitely looking forward to that. You know, she keeps losing her AirPods. Uh Mark and I keep they telling don't her, you know, properly. that's the problem. You got to like, you know, tape it to your belt or something. Mark Gurman, of course, uh, covers everything Apple for us. Uh, we'll catch up with him next week, I'm sure, on the back of that product announcement on Monday. And don't forget, we'll have full coverage of Apple earnings, I believe, coming out on Thursday. Meanwhile, here on this Friday, we continue to count you down to those closing bells. Phil Orlando, Federated Hermes, Chief Equity Market Strategist, going to be stopping by the program in just one second. Don't go anywhere. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Foos. Some breaking news crossing the Bloomberg terminal. Just in the last few minutes, we're learning that General Motors and Stellantis are said to have matched that 25% pay hike that the United Auto Workers Union had won out of Ford. Remember, just a couple of days ago, Ford did agree to a tentative labor agreement with the United Auto Workers that includes a 25% hourly wage hike over the life of that contract. So basically over the course of, I believe, about four years. And now Bloomberg reporting uh, saying that General Motors has also agreed to match that 25% a wage increase, uh, Scarlett. Uh, that also includes a cost of living increase over uh, the more than four-year contract. And Stellantis, of course, uh, the maker of the Chrysler and Jeep vehicles, uh, said to also uh, be willing to match that offer as well. Yeah, this comes two days after Ford uh, struck a tentative deal with the UAW. It has not yet been approved, of course, by the members, but that would be the next step. And the details are still kind of vague. Uh, we know there's that 25% salary increase, but a lot of the other details uh, yeah. still have not yet been revealed until it is uh, agreed upon, formally voted in. 
What's interesting is the stock price reaction, General Motors and Ford shares, falling to session lows on this headline. Yeah, some of this might have to do also with kind of uh, what we heard out of Ford as well. Yeah. Those shares are just having an awful day. Actually, their worst day going back, uh, I believe, the 2011 year. They're down more than 10 percent here. So you wonder how much of this is tied uh, to the cost of these contracts or more how much of it is tied to just the overall health uh, of their businesses here. And the lack of visibility into what this means for earnings, for numbers next year, the projection, especially as consumers retrench on some of those big ticket items. Yeah, and of course, uh, as we move uh, closer to the closing bells, the broader market is really trying to sort that out, not just with the automakers, but really uh, all the companies uh, writ large here. Uh, let's get uh, right uh, to our next guest, and maybe he can give us some insights uh, into what's going on as we look at an S&P 500 down about six-tenths of a percent, uh, and yields, though, starting to uh, pull back just a little bit from that 5 percent level we preached early in the week. Phil Orlando, Federated Hermes Chief Equity Market Strategist, joining us right now. And Phil, I, let's start off with the earnings picture here. We were just talking about Ford, GM, and Stellantis. Obviously, there's a big cost story there that investors are going to have to reconcile with over the next few uh, weeks and, and months uh, once we do get ratification of these contracts. But there is a broader question here just about the health of these businesses, the health of consumer spending. Conflicting messages here. Great consumer uh, data coming out of the government. But when you look at corporate earnings, is that spending there? Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Romaine, for having me back on. Uh, and thanks for starting with an 18-part question. Uh, <laughs> I hope we have a couple of hours to, to go through this. Let's start with the auto companies. I, I'm delighted that the strike has ended. Uh, the auto companies started offering about a 10% wage increase. The auto companies, uh, the uh, UAW, wanted a 46% increase, and I think they were able to come to a reasonable compromise at 25%. But Scarlett made an excellent point. We don't know what all of the details are for all of the other benefits. Mm -hmm. and, and I think part of the reason why the stocks are selling off as sharply as they are is that the street is, is sort of reading through on what the numbers mean. Going into the strike, uh, Tesla workers, for example, would get paid about $45 an hour all in. Uh, the European uh, companies, uh, BMW, Mercedes, Honda, they get paid about $55 an hour all in. The UAW workers would get about $65 an hour all in. That's before the strike. Mm -hmm. Now, they just got a 25% increase, plus presumably some other benefits. What, what does that do in terms of putting the big three at a cost disadvantage mm -hmm. at a time, as you pointed out, inventories are piling up? Uh, EVs are becoming less popular. They're not selling through. Uh, is the UAW going to be able to maintain a 40 percent market share and actually thrive in an environment where their cost structure now well, might be 90 or or $100 an hour? Well, I'm glad you went there because, I mean, this was the argument uh, that we actually heard uh, from the, uh, the leaders of Ford uh, and to a certain extent that we also heard from Mary Barra over at GM. And, I mean, just to Bloom, just so you know, I mean, Bloomberg actually did the numbers, and I think they took it from something like 28 up to 64 bucks an hour when you factor in all the benefits there, which does put it ab above a lot of the non-unionized peers, or some of the non-unionized peers, I should say here. But the question is, is there a, a, a sales growth story? Is there a shift in the types of vehicles that they're going to be selling long term that justifies 64 bucks? So th that's a very interesting question because the, the stuff that's been working well for these companies uh, over the last several years have been the big uh, SUVs and the trucks, gasoline-powered uh, vehicles. Uh, the companies are now trying to shift over to the EVs. Uh, there was an early surge with the early adopters, but as we've seen from Ford and GM and, and I, I think Stellantis, uh, EV sales have sort of slowed here uh, over uh, the last couple of quarters. And so now I think there's a legitimate question about it, what is the trajectory of EV growth? Are EVs going to take over the entire market in terms of 100 percent of auto sales, say, by the middle of next decade? I think that's a stretch, and, and this cost structure now – puts those companies at a disadvantage in terms of making the sort of investments they need in order to, you know, navigate the, the vicissitudes of the market. And I think you can also broaden this out beyond just the automakers, right? Because UPS cut its annual profit target for a second time in less than three months, in part because of an increase in labor costs after it uh, came to some kind of agreement with its union. So labor costs, which are a structural part of its cost structure, are going up right when the cyclical trend is working against some of these companies, whether you're an automaker or whether you're an industrial company. No question. Jay Powell mentioned that from the podium uh, at his presser on September 20th. 
energy prices and labor prices were the two of the things they were watching closely. And you're right, it's not just the auto companies or UPS. We could talk about the legacy airlines. The question is, when the managements of these companies extend these kinds of wage gains, what are they going to do? Are they going to pass those higher costs onto us? in the form of higher prices, that's inflationary, or are they going to absorb those higher labor costs in the form of slimmer profit margins, lower corporate earnings, lower share prices? Mm -hmm. Potentially that's stagflationary. Neither of those things are good. And the market right now, you know, down 10 percent in the last three months, is trying to figure all of this out. And is there any reason, do you see anything on the horizon that could uh, stem this, this negativity, this sour sentiment that we have in the market at the moment? I, I think the questions of what is the trajectory of inflation and what is the uh, future Fed policy look like? We've got an FOMC meeting coming up next week and then again on December 13th. We'd love to be able to see the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, giving us some guidance that, OK, maybe we've got one more hike in here. Maybe we're done. Mm -hmm. Inflation is doing what we need to do. At this point, we think we can go on pause until the back half of next year. Mm -hmm. Why is that good for stocks? Stocks historically rip on pauses. So we need a little bit more certainty yeah. in terms of what's going on with inflation and Fed policy. All right, Phil, going to have to leave it there. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, we'll catch up uh, soon uh, with you again soon, I'm sure. Thank Phil you. Orlando over at Federated Hermes helping us count down to those closing bells, which are just about two minutes or so away. Stick with us. We are getting closer to those bells, and our market coverage uh, begins right now as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell and here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with our friends Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic. Welcome to our audiences across our Bloomberg platforms on a down week for the markets. Yeah. Uh, once again here as earnings aren't necessarily saving us and I'm not sure the Fed is going to save them either. Yeah, that's going to be interesting, right? The Fed decision next week, that'll be a focal point uh, along with some really important earnings as well. But it is interesting to see the negative tone, uh, even though we kind of are leveling out here, but we're are definitely way off our highs of the session today. Uh, Eric Clark, a portfolio manager over at Rational Dynamic Brands Funds, thinks the consumer is actually going to save us. He thinks people have written off the consumer. And look, he's got a lot of consumer-focused companies, including Nike, Lululemon, Apple, uh, Live Nation, inside his he Rational likes that Dynamic baby Brand boomer Funds. Trade, doesn't he? he does like the baby boomer trade, but he says, hey, what about that $7 trillion in money market funds? People have that money just sitting there. Um, they could still spend it on goods and services. Yeah, but it's making so much money for us. It's, you know, we have a 5% yield on that so why would anyone take that out maybe they want to go see taylor swift do you need to buy concert. another pair of uggs <laughs> yes or, or, yeah, or go exactly. to europe yes <laughs> the answer from carol is yes yes and yes yolo <laughs> it's the yolo trade i hope my husband's not listening and of course, you look at uh, what happened with Ford and uh, GM mm -hmm. and Stellantis over the last hour. We're hearing, of course, that uh, GM and Stellantis is looking to match the 25% pay increase that Ford has offered to the UAW. Uh, perhaps the strike is coming to an end, but then we have to contend with the absorption of higher costs for all three automakers. Yeah, I mean, sources is telling Bloomberg that they're working this deal out today and could announce it on Sunday, but we were just talking here on the television program, guys, about just the share reaction. I mean, they were already down even before the latest news here, but you're talking about you know, a four to five percent yeah. loss on GM on the day. And Ford, the last time I checked, was actually on pace for its worst day. Going back to 2011. Down 12 percent. A Dow Jones Industrial Average not having a great day or a great week. Down about a percent on the day. Back down to around 32,400. The S&P 500, another close below 4,200. Down 20 points or about five tenths of a percent here on the day. And the Nasdaq Composite actually holding on to some of its gains here, up about four tenths of a percent on the day, though we should point out still in the red on the week. And the Russell 2000 not gaining any traction. That is your laggard for the major indices down 20 points or one. Point two percent. Yeah, risk off certainly for the week overall when it comes to the equity trade. Having said that, Scarlett, I'm looking at the S&P 500. Uh, you know, this is the day. Most names down, 414 uh, to the downside in the S&P 500. 89, though, actually gaining ground. I'll get into some of those. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got uh, none unchanged. But you've got the major industry groups. And the industry groups really highlight how the Magnificent Seven are the star performers in today's trade. You look at the gainers here, retail, that's Amazon, semiconductor equipment makers, that's Intel, 
Hotel, Tech Hardware and Equipment, Media and Entertainment, Magnificent Seven all represented there. On the downside, there's, I mean, pick your poison. You've got banks off by more than 3%, pharma companies off by about 2.5%, energy stocks lower by 2%, 2.3%. Uh, a lot of decliners there, but the big tech names are, are keeping the S&P 500 from falling more. Yeah, before, I got it. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, please. just before we move on to some yeah. of the individual names, I mean, we kind of be remiss not in pointing out here mm -hmm. that the S&P now down 10% uh, from that uh, year-to-date high, which was, of course, back uh, on July 31st. That's the same uh, high that we saw for some of the other indices. That NASDAQ 100, remember, even though it did manage to close higher today, was already down about 11% from that high in July. And, of course, the Russell, which has uh, been in the doldrums now, now down about 18% from its year-to-date high in mid-July here. So uh, we're talking about some really significant declines here, at least uh, if you pay attention to these kind of round technical levels. Well, it speaks yeah. to the volatility, like in a short you know, time span, if you will. And if you think about over the last, what, six months, 12 months, the different thinkings, just think about it. It was earlier this year we were worried about the regional bank sector and whether that was going to be much more broadly felt in the U.S. economy. Uh, and then we saw a rally and then we saw a sell-off. So it has been uh, quite the back and forth, if you will, but, in well, terms When does that shake sentiment, though? You talk about year-to-date gains on the S&P now that are only at 7%. They were double that, yeah. what, at the end of, like, June uh, or mid-July or so, I believe. Here you have a Dow Jones Industrial Average is now is in the red on a year-to-date basis. And I was telling Scarlett earlier, over in Europe, they've basically erased all of their gains for the year, or at least are on the precipice of doing it. Yeah, we spoke to Jeff Kleintop earlier this week down at uh, Charles Schwab. Carol, Carol alluded to this earlier, but he said, forget the U.S., uh, increase your mm -hmm. allocation to Europe. Uh, they're, to they're, Europe? Yeah, to Europe. They're, they're feeling it worse in Europe right now. Stocks are cheaper in Europe, he yeah. said, on a valuation basis. That is where the opportunity Talked is. Talked about outperformances, too, in terms of some of those European names. But Not I mean, seeing it yet, though, right? Not seeing it yet. Yeah, He's not saying not seeing go it in yet. while it's feeling exactly. bad. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, well, you know, but what? Well, let's get to the idea, Carol. And I, I know you, you need to kind of get to some of the yeah, individual okay. gainers. No, but I, I am curious that when you when you go through those gainers, that what what sort of moved the market here? I mean, we're not getting that um from the big cap tech names. I know at least on a weekly basis, we certainly didn't get it. I know some of them did perform okay on the day, including Amazon. Well, it's interesting that yeah. you say that because you know when Intel was up what about nine point three percent. That's one of my yeah. gainers. We know we all broke the earnings uh, last night, and it looks like maybe the turnaround right is working. We heard from the CEO on Bloomberg TV. And initially in the day, I'm just looking right now, the Sox did finish with about a 1.2% gain. But earlier in the session, not a lot of names were moving to the upside. And it was interesting. I thought, well, it should have, you know, brought the whole market up in terms of the semi market, if you will. But it looks like it took some time to kind of get there. Um, so kind of interesting. I mean, Amazon up 6.8%. Interesting name. Uh, it finished off its highs of the session. We know, again, the earnings, the cloud, AWS, also the retail side of the picture. But I know what you're saying, you know that it didn't ultimately raise the whole group and keep it there in the trade. And it just speaks to some of the nervousness that is out there. And it gets to the idea, too. I mean, Amazon, you kind of forget their weighting isn't quite, that doesn't quite have the same impact as some of the others. And it kind of leaves Amazon what? Amazon does, though, right? That's a pretty significant one on the S&P and the NASDAQ. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, not, oh, I'm not saying it is, but I'm yeah. just saying, like, we talk about what's going to be the salvation. We've only got, what, two magnificent seven names left. In fact, and when you look at the biggest weighted names, what is it? It's basically Apple next week and NVIDIA uh, and what, maybe like uh, two a or three weeks, weeks after yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hey, I just want to mention Dexcom only because it's been on a tear. It keeps showing up and popping up in the top of the... Uh, and not to belabor the point, but Amazon is down like 12% from its uh, year-to-date high. Sorry no, to interrupt. No, no, no. Yeah. What is it that you say, Tim? You went in doubt, zoom out. Okay. Yeah. I like to set him up for that. <laughs> hey, Dexcom, I just want to mention because we keep talking... <laughs> I like it. I, I stole like... that from Katie Greifeld. I mean, like I got to cite my like sources. It's running for here. office, you know? Um, Dexcom, though, again, another 10% um, move in the upside. This company coming out with their results. Uh, this has been under a lot of pressure. It was down 45% earlier uh, over a period of time on concerns over all of those uh, new uh, kind of weight loss drugs and thinking that people didn't need these glucose monitors. Anyway, uh, the company came out. It raised its revenue guidance for the full year. So it allayed some of those uh, fears, and it also brought some of the other names in the, in the group, Tandem Diabetes mm -hmm. and Insulet, also were gaining in today's session. Right, we should note Eli Lilly reporting next week, and they're certainly working on their own version of a GLP-1, yeah. uh, trying to get that approved for weight loss purposes. Uh, there were more than 400 stocks in the S&P 500 that were lower today. I had so many decliners to choose from. I do want to start with Chevron. Uh, Chevron falling the most since 2020 on disappointing profits, down 6.7% today. It missed third quarter expectations by 66 cents per share. Uh, this came after uh, amid losses uh, from overseas refining, rising costs at uh, oil field project in Kazakhstan.
extend. We should note that ExxonMobil also reported lower than expected third quarter results, though it cited weak results in its chemical business uh, for those results. Uh, Ford falling uh, the most since 2011 at the close, uh, the most in, in more than a year. Shares down more than 12 percent today. Missed third quarter earnings expectations. It cited higher costs, lower quality. We learned yesterday that it was pulling its forecast for adjusted EBITDA. This just after boosting it in July. We saw a similar move from GM earlier this week. Uh, the UAW work strike costing a lot of money for the company, $100 million in the third quarter uh, for a total of $1.3 billion uh, so far. We should note it did win labor peace through a tentative contract with uh, the UAW. Uh, and then finally, I want to take a look at shares of J.P. Morgan, uh, shares down close to 4 percent, or I should say it closed, yeah, down 3.6 percent, after investors learned that Jamie Dimon plans to sell shares that are currently worth about $141 million, or now, I guess, $135 million after today's move. That's so, a good yeah. quick math. Yeah, thank you <laughs> for mm -hmm. such transactions since he took the helm of J.P. Morgan nearly 18 years ago, guys. All right, let's start checking on the yield space real quick here. You did see yields drop on the short end and the middle of the curve here, the two, the five, the 10 year, all lower here on the day. And we should point out across the entirety of the curve, we are lower on the week. So a bit of a respite from the sell off that we have been seeing in the Treasury space. So we should point out here, you take a look at those fives in front of those numbers here, five on the 30 year yield, of course, five on the 20 and five on the two year, the 10 year pulling back from that 5% level here. But of course, this has been uh, the scary part, at least for yeah. a lot of investors. Well, I guess are too young to remember the last time we were here uh, and how they adjust to that uh, uh, environment. Yeah, well, for all intents and purposes, the tenure did get to 5%. It got there earlier this week. Uh, it's retreated a little bit. One thing that we should mention, and we do so every Friday, is that investors might be a little bit uh, weary of being too long heading into the weekend, given that uh, Israeli forces are expanding their activity in the Gaza Strip. We don't know what's going to happen over the weekend. Oil prices are higher. Gold prices also higher, uh, moving above that $2,000 uh, an ounce mark. Yeah, those are some interesting trading moves and certainly in reaction to that um, concerns in the Middle East. All right, guys, that's a wrap. We've got a big week coming up, but you all have a good and safe weekend. And we will see you, of course, on Monday. All right, that's a wrap. Our cross-platform, radio, TV, YouTube, and Bloomberg Originals. We will see you next week. And continuing our coverage here on Bloomberg Television, a lot more coming up here on the close, including a focus here on the banking turmoil that we saw earlier this year. Uh, Sheila Bear, the former head of the FDIC, had a lot to say about the turmoil that occurred and the fact that, in her words, it's not quite over. Some highlights from that conversation coming up after the break. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Second straight week of declines for uh, the broader market here in the U.S. That's on the back of a pretty uh, heavy week of earnings. Earnings that largely were a bit of a disappointment. That doesn't necessarily mean they were awful, but they certainly did not give investors that boost that they were looking for. The idea here that not only the revenue growth story was still intact, but the profitability story was still intact as well. In fact, here on this Friday, you're looking at an S&P 500 closing 10 percent down from its year-to-date high set back in July. The Nasdaq 100 down about 11 percent from its year-to-date high, and the Russell 2000 has almost approaching 20 percent territory, down about 18 percent from its year-to-date high as well. On a weekly basis here, there wasn't a whole lot of places to hide out here. Energy stocks, which of course had been one of the big defense mechanisms earlier this year, sold off pretty heavily. That is now a story that seems to be dictated by the oscillations that we continue to see on crude prices. The Magnificent Seven didn't provide the boost that investors were looking for either, as a group down almost 3 percent here on the on the week and Dow transports that cyclical trade that cyclical trade has never really gained any traction in fact one of the few bright spots here was one of the rate sensitive sectors here the rate sensitive sectors that actually benefited from the drop in yields and that is utilities as far as some of the individual names a lot of concerns here about consumer spending here uh, some of the names that we saw this week did hold up but when you take a look at line the CEO there talked a lot about this idea of just how discretionary Invisalign basically braces are for a lot of people and when the going gets tough here, they start to cut back on some of those items. Similar commentary out of Whirlpool, basically saying, look, they had to offer a lot of promotions in order to get people to buy those uh, dishwashers and refrigerators here, but there's just not enough volume there to make up for the gap that they've seen based on the previous comparisons. And then Weight Watchers and Rollins, those are two bright spots. On a weekly basis, they did pretty well here. So losing weight and, well, pest control, I guess that might actually be the winning trade, at least what it was for the past five days. 
Also doing somewhat well this week were actually a lot of the bank stocks. In fact, some of the regional bank stocks did start to get a bid. They're still well off their highs in what we saw earlier this year. I had a chance to catch up with a, a former a chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, a Sheila Bear. She was here in New York over at the Churchill Capitals annual meeting. And I had a chance to ask her about the crisis in the banking sector earlier this year. She said it wasn't necessarily a crisis. It was more like turmoil. But she said that turmoil is far from over. It was banking 101, really. I mean, just basic <laughs> interest rate risk mismanagement. And, you know, the, the, the managers of those banks have the, the primary responsibility, but clearly the supervisors, uh, the supervisory process could have done better. I fear that maybe what's been going on is the same thing I confronted when I became to the FDIC in 2006, when we'd been through a fairly benign period in banking, strong banking profitability, very few failures. And people just got complacent. You know, there was more, you know, with the, the examiner authorities had been cut back. There was more process around the examination, uh, fewer resources for examination. And that, that's just part of the natural cycle. And I think it's important for all the bank regulators to remember, you know, this is a cyclical business and it can turn quickly. And you need to really um, maintain vigilance to make sure your supervisory staff is, is well resourced, well educated, and, and ready to react because they weren't in those situations uh, clearly. I mean, is the staffing actually there to do that? I mean, yeah. that was a big criticism. Saying I that think, a yeah. lot of these agencies really didn't they have didn't, it. They didn't. They, they need to staff up. And if, if bankers in the room won't, probably won't like to hear me say that, but I actually think, yeah, I mean, it, it, the re, the, when I came to the FDIC again in 2006, this was a very bad problem. We had very, very low morale uh, with the examination staff who had deep cutbacks. We turned course and staffed up very quickly, and it, it, was, it was better quality oversight for the banks because they had more time and more thought to spend at the banks. And supervision can be a collaborative process. I mean, there, there should be a healthy tension between a bank and a supervisor. But supervisors can provide value to banks, and I think good bank managers would appreciate that. But you need to have, again, the training and the resources and the time for the examiners to go in there and do their job. So. Um, it was a wake-up call. Hopefully, I think there probably will be more bank failures, but I know uh, the FDIC and the Fed and the OCC are all on top of this now to, to make sure the resources and the training are there for their examiners. When you say they're all on top of this now, does that mean that the crisis has been contained? Is it over? I don't think, you know, crisis is such a, a, a common word now, so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not sure what happened in the spring was a crisis. I think it was turmoil. Um, I think there will be more turmoil. I think there's still a lot of stress on the regional banks and some of the smaller banks as well. Um, there are, you know, interest rates. We get through this transition, actually, higher rates will be a good thing for banks that have a traditional model of taking deposits and making loans. It's very hard to make a decent margin when interest rates are near zero. So we get to rate normalization, eventually this will be good for banks, but right now, They've got a lot of low-yielding assets. Securities are underwater. Their deposit costs are going up. The, you know, the, the, the yields on the assets are low, so their, their, their margins are being compressed. So that is, this transition period is going to be stressful for them. I think it's more like the SNL crisis we had in the 80s than it is the great financial crisis where we, it was more of a sudden shock. But uh, it, it's still, uh, it's going to be a challenge. And no, I don't think it's over. When you draw that parallel though with the SNL crisis and you look at economic conditions today, you look at not just the level of rates, obviously rates are much higher back in right. the SNL crisis, but the trajectory yeah. of where rates have gone here, how much does, does that complicate things? Yeah, well, it does. I mean, I think, look, I, I think Jay Powell's done a, a masterful job of, of, of dealing with this, communicating to the public. He's been a very open Fed chair. But I think they, they did wait too long uh, to, to start to tighten. They missed it. And then they've had to rush to, to, to try to change course. So yeah, I mean, you look, on a percentage basis, if you look at how much rates went up in 2022 on a percentage basis, mm -hmm. it was over 6,000%. I mean, you've got, you know, in, in absolute terms, these rates don't seem high by historical standards or not. But if you look at where we started and where we are now, that's a huge jump in, in financing costs. And the former chair there of the FDIC here in the U.S., Sheila Bear, is speaking a little bit earlier about the banking turmoil and some of the issues that still need to be sorted out. Coming up here on the program, a focus on education uh, from two different perspectives here. We're actually going to hear from the CEO of the online higher ed company, Coursera, he joins us to talk about his company's earnings and the trends that he sees driving this sector. That conversation up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
Let's talk endowments. Princeton University's endowment has fallen to $34 billion during the latest fiscal year. That is a 1.7% decline. Now, keep in mind that endowment funds at Princeton cover more than 70% of the financial aid budget for undergraduates. So that has huge implications. Here with us now is Janet Lauren, our higher education reporter at Bloomberg News. And Princeton is not alone because a lot of the endowments uh, have down arrows, don't they? Uh, a handful have been negative this year, including MIT and Duke, and they blame it really on their exposure to venture capital, which traditionally has given them a gigantic boost. The whole private equity uh, return for Princeton two years ago was almost 100%. Hmm. So you can win some years, and you know this year was not a great year for them. Well, that's interesting too, because I mean Princeton, of course, I felt like they were kind of at the forefront and sort of yes. moving to these alternative uh, asset managers. We'll just call it that here. So is this the sense that this is just kind of a one-year blip, and at some point they'll make this up? Yes. Yeah. Well, if you look at them over 10 years and how private equity is done, I think it was 19% annualized over 10 years. Mm -hmm. So these endowments do invest for the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, and a place like Princeton is especially reliant on its, on its endowment for income, but you know they're looking not for one year, but 10 year and 20 years down the road. Mm -hmm. And as you know, these venture capital investments are not going to be turning around tomorrow. Yeah. You know, they are for the long term. I'm looking at some other numbers. Harvard's endowment earned an investment return of almost 3%, and in fact, uh, doing better than Yale. Yale, which of course was at the forefront of expanding to private assets. Right, but you know, this year, in the same time period, the S&P was up 18%. And Harvard, in its annual report, specifically said, do not compare us to a one-year return in the S&P because we have to manage for risk. Janet Lauren uh, covering uh, education for us. An interesting look here at some of the latest data uh, on the endowment performances at the big schools. Princeton now uh, at near the bottom, at the bottom, I should say, here uh, in the most recent round. We want to continue our focus here on education and take it from a different angle right now and talk about Coursera, of course, the online ed tech company. Pleased to say that the CEO, Jeff Maggion, Maggion Calda, is joining us right now to talk a little bit more about his recently uh, posted results uh, for the third quarter. And Jeff, uh, thanks for being here. Here. And uh, when I was going through these results and I was thinking about kind of what drives growth, not just in the quarter of the past, but what's going forward here, what exactly are you dependent on? What do you need to see out of your customer base or your potential customer base to reaccelerate growth? Uh, I think we're having some issues. Oh, there we go. We have you, Jeff. Go ahead. We've been growing at a really good clip. Clearly, during COVID, things really took off when it comes to online. But just in the last quarter, you know, we posted 21% overall you know, year on year revenue growth. And the thing that really has been driving our revenue growth for the last five years has been change. You know, change creates threats and, and change creates opportunities. But if people can get education, if people can get skills, then they're going to have a pathway to new jobs. And so as, as the world changes faster, mm -hmm. people realize they can scale up for new jobs and that they need to scale up for new jobs. What, what's more lucrative for you, the partnerships with the universities or the partnerships uh, with private companies? Well, it's really a mix. We have three different segments. We have our consumer segment. We have our enterprise segment where we sell to institutions. And mm -hmm. then we have our degree segment, which is clearly universities. In the consumer segment, what's really been driving our growth, we grew 27% revenue growth in the consumer segment in Q3 year on year. It's been professional certificates. And these are industry-based job training programs for jobs that are in high demand and don't require a college degree. So the industry players are really driving our consumer segment. The university players are driving our degree segment. So usually, and I, I guess this goes back a couple years now, when the economy starts turning south, you see people investing in their education, building up their credentials. Is that still a reliable gauge? Is that still the pattern? Well, it really kind of depends. I mean, when the economy turns south, there's a question of do we mean sort of the GDP or do we mean unemployment? It is the case that historically, when unemployment goes up, people often go back to school and, and sort of retool and get a degree so they can go back into the labor market. When labor markets have been tight, people are more are less likely to go back to school. What we've been been seeing at Coursera is the degree segment is seeing some of the headwinds from a tight labor market, but a lot of people are going to these professional certificates, which are shorter and cheaper, a little bit more affordable mm -hmm. and more job aligned, to try to retool for new jobs. 
So uh, this year has been the year of efficiency for Meta, and a lot of big tech companies have been on some kind of cost-cutting drive and have been rewarded for it by shareholders. What does their cost-cutting mean for Coursera when it comes to certification programs or any kind of uh, partnerships that they link up with you? It's a great question. You know, it, when you think about what companies are trying to do, they're trying to increase operating leverage. And one of the ways you can do that is by reducing cost. Another way that you can do it is by increasing productivity. On the one hand, what we've seen in 2023, and we saw this in our Coursera for Business segment, we saw companies scaling back on training and reskilling that they did during COVID. At the same time, everybody is talking about generative AI and the potential productivity gains that are available if you can reskill your people to use these new tools that can make people far more productive and free people up to do more interesting, valuable work. I'm curious, when you talk about the competition in this space here, there, uh, and I'm talking about the traditional competitors, not, you know, whatever newfangled uh, AI thing is going to sort of disrupt us and at you know, some point in the future here, oh, what becomes a value proposition? Like, how do you go up against uh, those names and, and say and make a case uh, that the Coursera platform will somehow offer uh, these, uh, what, you know, these folks who are looking for training a better uh, opportunity? All right, well, you put your finger on it. People are looking for career advancement. And Generally speaking, what they want is, is not only to develop the skills, you know, from high quality branded players like Stanford and Yale and Google and AWS, but they want to have a credential that shows that they've learned these skills. That's how they can advance their careers. And Coursera really works with a hundred and uh, with 300 of the top university and industry players. It's not just the video content. It's actually skilling and project development where you're building projects and a credential that you could show, whether that's a professional certificate or a college degree, you can show that to an employer to advance your career. And that's something that's pretty different from a lot of the other players who are in the ed tech market. All right, Jeff, it was great to catch up with you here. Uh, the CEO there of uh, Coursera on the, fresh, on the heels of their earnings here, a fresh look here at what's been going on in the education sector. Coming up here, we're going to take a closer look here uh, at where people are looking to invest their money and why there might be a generational divide in determining exactly where to go, Scarlett. I don't know, this speaks, I don't know. We're not in here once again. It's boomers versus millennials. Once again, I know. they're forgetting. Our cohort <laughs> always gets left out. It's so not fair. Oh, Sun Kwong, U.S. equity strategist at Bank of America, Stopping by in just one second. This is Bloomberg. A second straight week of declines for the broader market here in the U.S., setting up for what's going to be a third straight monthly decline for the broader markets here in the U.S. In fact, the S&P 500 closing 10 percent below that year-to-date high set back in late July. The Nasdaq had already been there, down about 11 percent, and the Russell 2000 had also already been there, down about 18 percent from its year-to-date high set back in mid-July. We were supposed to get a little bit of help this week out of earnings with about 160 companies in the S&P reporting, but some big disappointments coming out of names like Alphabet and Meta, that really did tamp down sentiment, and that's setting up next week, which could be very interesting. We do get some big names, including Apple. Will they save the market? What about McDonald's? What about VF Corp? What about Starbucks? A lot of questions right now about the health of the corporate sector and whether that's also a reflection of the U.S. economy. As you put it, Romain, uh, a big week again for earnings. Uh, we had about $16 trillion worth of companies reporting last week. This next week, about $9 trillion of companies. So Jess Menton is here with us to give us a snapshot. Romain mentioned Apple. That is top of mind coming out on Thursday. It definitely is. So we have a, more than 20% of the market cap for the S&P 500 reporting. So then you have the biggest stock when you're looking at market cap for the S&P 500 as well as the NASDAQ 100 reporting. And it's been a rough three months for Apple. So since it peaked back in July. It's actually lost about 14% of its value. So briefly hitting that $3 trillion valuation, the first company obviously to do that, but since then has come under pressure. A lot of that obviously has to do with the concern about what it could potentially mean for slowing iPhone sales when it does come to yeah. some of these potential import bans with those issues related to China. Yeah, and the fact that it costs $1,200. I'm sure that has nothing <laughs> to do with it. doesn't but help. One, one thing I like when we get to kind of past the first couple weeks of earnings season, because it seems everything's so weighted towards tech and uh, 
uh, banks. But once we get move on, you get a much more of a broader cross-section of the economy. We're going to get a, uh, a few retailers. We're going to get some uh, restaurant companies. And, of course, we're going to get here about some of these weight loss drugs uh, from some of the uh, pharmaceutical companies Of course, as well. Eli Lilly. So I know we've talked so much during the simulcast with radio about when you are looking at Eli Lilly and then Manjaro, it's obesity drug and now, the hype around that. that's not actually on the market, right? Not, no. And not, not as a uh, weight loss treatment. No, right? not yet. And so yeah. analysts are hoping that the FDA does end up approving that by year and so that's going to be key to see what those executives do say more about that on the call because that stock did hit a record just after its last earnings report, but it actually just peaked out and now it's trading uh, below its 50 day moving average. All right. Well, they'll probably give some forecasts and it'll <laughs> go up once again. Uh, Romaine mentioned consumer companies, restaurants. So McDonald's. McDonald's has got to be the big one that really is going to give us indication of how the consumer spending. And we just got off of Chipotle's earnings. So yeah. a lot of the focus has been, especially when you're looking at California, they just went through this mandate as far as trying to raise the minimum wage and what that definitely means for that industry, especially as a lot of them, and including McDonald's, have raised the costs on a lot of different products. And what that means, obviously, is especially when you're looking at labor costs and what that means for margins. So that's going to be really key focus, as well as those comparable store sales, because over the last three months, the last uh, seven weeks out of that quarter actually has come down. All right, Jess Menton, who uh, loves to lead our cross-asset coverage here at Bloomberg, she's going to be very busy uh, next week. And, of course, earnings season is always a time for people to sort of decide whether they re want to reallocate, find out who the winners are, who the losers are. But apparently, I'm being told right now, is that you want to make a bet on old people. Millennials, all those young people, that's passe. Apparently, the baby boomers and the trades that are surround them are exactly where it's at. At least that's the view of our next guest, who did some interesting analysis about some of the stocks that could actually benefit from some of the economic conditions out there that seem to be hurting millennials while at the same time maybe favoring some of those baby boomers. Uh, Bank of America equity strategist Oh Sung Kwong joining us right now has been looking into this situation. We should point out this is one of the most read stories on the Bloomberg terminal. Uh, you're hitting a lot of key points here, but let's start with uh, the boomer side of this trade here, because you're saying that there's some strength there, partly because of these economic conditions, right? Yeah, thanks yeah. for having me today. Yeah. And to really understand why boomers are doing well, we really have to go back to 1980. Mm -hmm. And during the 40-year period from 1980 to 2020, there was a massive wealth transfer from the government, the public sector, to the private sector, basically the corporates and the consumer. Mm -hmm. The government debt to GDP went from 30% in 1980 to 120% by 2020. The U.S. 10-year yield went from 12% to sub 1% in 2020. And the resulting impact was a massive wealth creation mm -hmm. for uh, the total household net worth right yeah. now is $150 trillion, uh, which is about 5.5 times nominal GDP, yeah. half of which is owned by baby boomers. Yes. And all of a sudden, the uh, harder rate on financial assets just went from 0% to 5%, meaning more interest income for these boomers. Well, that gets to, but then what's the flip side of this with millennials, who, have, quite frankly, have been complaining for years about baby boomers? Uh, what is it about them right now that makes their situation a little bit less favorable, at least in the context of investing? Yeah, so millennials yeah. don't really have that wealth that boomers have. Mm -hmm. Also, the home ownership is a lot lower for millennials versus boomers. So if you look at the total U.S. household right now, the effective mortgage rate on all mortgages outstanding today is actually still below where we were before COVID. Wow. So everyone basically locked in 25 3% mortgage rates, rates except millennials. Millennials are the only cohort that took up mortgage in a meaningful way since the hiking cycle began. It's up about 20%. Mm -hmm. So they're really seeing the impact of higher mortgages, higher interest rates, whereas boomers and older, older generations, they basically locked in everything. Okay, so you make a great case for why the boomers are in a better position than the millennials. What does that mean in terms of how you invest? Like what companies should you be looking at here? Yeah, so, kinds of companies. Right. so there are some ways to invest. Uh, so they have, boomers and millennials have different spending patterns. So if you look at where boomers typically spend on, they typically spend more on healthcare, home improvement, entertainment. Uh, if you look at where bo uh, millennials spend on, they disproportionately spend more on housing and apparel. So you want to own companies that are more exposed to uh, boomer spending and maybe want to avoid companies that are more exposed to millennials. One interesting area is housing. And this, this is fascinating because th this is where we are seeing the next 
uh, wealth transfer happening, uh -huh. basically from boomers to yeah. millennials. Well, that's what I'm going to say. The boomers are going to die at some point, right? And then they, are they not going to leave the, all these riches to their uh, children and grandchildren? They probably yeah. have another yeah. 20, 30, maybe 40 years left. But oh, they're ageless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. So, so, so is that all those improvements in health care apparently yeah. are, are working against them. <laughs> Right, but um, the housing sector is yeah. really interesting because we are starting to see the real evidence of that wealth transfer happening. Uh -huh. If you look at the percentage of cash buyers, it's at about 30%, basically at an all-time high. Uh -huh. If you look at the percentage of uh, down payments that are funded by gifts, basically parents paying down payments for their kids, mm -hmm. that's also surging. Uh -huh. So those are really the big evidence that this next wealth transfer is happening. Okay, so housing gets tricky, but everything else, you know, maybe buy golf companies or golfware companies and healthcare, avoid some of the retail spending that millennials favor. I'm gonna have to, for, for Romaine and my sake, we are Gen X and we're not represented in any of this and we feel kind of left out. What is Gen X's financial position? What is our earnings position and how does it figure into any of this, if at all? Yeah, so, sorry guys, but <laughs> Gen X is kind of between the middle, between yes, the boomers familiar. and millennials. Yeah. They're not doing as great as boomers, but not doing poorly as yeah. millennials. Uh, if you look at credit card delinquency data, it's also very interesting because we have seen a lot sharper increase in millennial delinquency. Mm -hmm. Millennials are actually the only cohort that has higher delinquency rate today versus pre-COVID. And we have seen more, much tepid, uh, it, it was, we have seen a little bit of increase, but not as much in boomer, uh, boomers and Gen X uh, or other generations. Uh, th yeah, and, and we should point out too, I mean, being Gen X, I would think when the boomers do pa die off, that that would pass first to the Gen Xers <laughs> before it goes down to... No, the, the, the boomers' kids are millennials. No, Our parents no. were the silent generation, Romain. Are they? Yeah. Okay. Sorry I'm to say. Anyway, um, well, I don't know. If you ever met my mother, she's anything but silent. <laughs> um, I, I love her. Um, I, but I, first of all, this is fascinating research. I mean, obviously, the headline grabs a lot of attention. But underlying this, you're effectively getting at the idea of some big structural changes in our economy that are here now and, of course, that are going to sort of materialize over the next you know, few decades as uh, the boomers age out and the younger generation uh, takes their place. Yeah, and yeah. this is th this is what yeah. the, you know, supporting reasons for the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. This is one of the reasons why the U.S. economy hasn't really felt the impact of one of the fastest hiking cycles in history. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, every, that, that recession that everyone's been talking about mm -hmm. for the past two years, that hasn't happened yet because the debt side is fixed. Mm -hmm. The U.S. household has so much net worth that everyone's talking about this, you know, excess savings since COVID, but yeah. that's just only a part of the story. Sure. That's just a difference between the, the cash level between today and pre-COVID levels. You have to look at the whole picture and the whole balance. Yeah, and I just like to say strong. for the record, I'm not going to say how old my mother is, but technically she is a baby. Okay, At least right. according to the internet tells me. Oh, so, so what kind yeah. of response have you gotten? Maybe not from Romaine's mother, but what, what have you gotten in terms of responses to your report? I'm just yeah, curious. I mean, the feedback has been great. I mean, it's very thematic. Yeah. Um, and we are actually seeing that in our Bank of America credit card data as well, that boomers and traditionalists, they are still increasing their spending. It's actually accelerating a little bit, whereas... Uh, Millennials, Gen Zs, even Gen X uh, are spending less. Yeah, it's yellow for the boomers. Oshan, this was uh, great to talk to you. I don't know where uh, Bank of America has been hiding you, but one of the most read stories on the terminal today is about some of the generational differences here and how you invest around it uh, as this plays out in the economy. Uh, we'll be uh, coming up here uh, after the break. We're going to have a question about, well, how much higher and for how much longer? Uh, Roger Altman says it might be forever. We're going to talk about why he thinks the era of low, ultra-low interest rates might be over for good. That conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg. That's not good for millennials. <laughs> Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week Daily segment, 
the host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, joins us as he does every day. And you had a chance to sit down with uh, somebody who knows a lot about what's mm -hmm. going on uh, in the economy and markets. And there's a lot of discussion right now about where interest rates are going and whether we just have to get comfortable with the fact that they're not going back down to zero anytime soon. Isn't that the truth? It's a big yeah. debate. We saw Janet mm -hmm. Yellen talking to Peggy Collins this week saying she thinks they're going to come back down. Larry Summers says no way, no how. Mm -hmm. So we turn to Roger Altman, who, as Romain says, has experience both on Wall Street and in Washington. He's the founder and senior chairman of Evercore. And we asked him, are we looking at longer, lower rates or longer, higher rates? Well, we, we've seen, to quote my friend Howard Marks, a sea change in the financial market environment uh, uh, in the sense that the very long, roughly 15-year period of ultra-low interest rates, at least I would argue, is over. It's not temporarily interrupted. It's over. And, uh, and now today, we, in round numbers, we have a 5% 10-year yield. And uh, we haven't seen that for, I think, since 2007. And I think a lot of market participants, and in particular to your question, uh, business leaders, are just beginning to, gra to grasp that we are in a new era in terms of the structure of interest rates. It's a profound change because it affects not just, obviously, cost of capital, but it affects uh, uh, asset allocation. Uh, it affects returns. I mean, if you're a financial, imagine you're a private equity firm and these, they are so ubiquitous. Uh, this fundamentally changes the return prospects uh, for them because the cost of that leverage is such that they can't leverage XYZ investment to the same degree today that they could have a year or two ago. So, but I think, I think a lot of people are just waking up to this, and I'm sure some people listening to this would disagree that we've seen the end of ultra-low interest rates, but I, I'm convinced we have. And, um, and, it, and it's really a profound change. Now, how much it affects you as a CEO depends on the nature of your business, how capital intensive it is. Are you, by the nature of your business, a, a, uh, to generate consistent free cash flow? Or are you, are you generating deficits instead and doing a lot of financing? So if you're, uh, if you're Apple, uh, you actually do borrow because of your international business versus domestic and the role of share buybacks. But you're not a net borrower uh, in terms of uh, net debt. And it, you know, it, it affects you, but it doesn't affect you very dramatically. But if you're uh, Blackstone or you're KKR or you're Apollo and so forth, very dramatic effect. So you say some corporate leaders are just waking up to this process. Is that, at least in part, the answer to a more fundamental question, at least I have? The economy seems to be charging along. When you look at GDP numbers, you look at retail sales, you look at so many indicators. Even the labor market may be loosening a bit, but it's still a pretty strong labor market. How can the economy doing this well when we've had this many rate hikes out of the Fed and this increase in the yields on the, on the bonds? I think a lot of the data we're looking at that you just referred to is, an, is defini definitionally backward-looking data. So we're about to get the uh, th uh, third quarter growth figure, GDP growth figure. It's going to be pretty good, I think. But it's, that quarter ended nearly a month ago. Um, I, I, I think the economy is slowing now. Uh, you're right that it's still resilient. It's not falling off a cliff. We're not, uh, there's no evidence at the moment of an incipient recession. I mean, like next week or next month. But I think it is slowing. You look at the housing sector, and of course, the, the, the sharp rise in mortgage rates always would have the effect it's having here. But new home sales, uh, mortgage applications all sharply down, as you would imagine. Uh, and you look at uh, a whole series of other surveys. At Evercore, we do uh, a series of proprietary surveys, trucking, temporary employment agencies, uh, uh, airlines, uh, restaurants. <laughs> a whole series of them, and we do them regularly, and I think it's quite a good set of data. And they're pointing to a serious slowdown. So the composite reading of our uh, surveys is above recession levels, but it's come down a lot. So I think the economy, despite the backward-looking strong data, is slowing down. Are we about to have a recession? I don't think so. I don't know about next year, but not. I don't think in the rest of this year, 2023. But there's definitely a slowdown occurring. By the way, for your data, I get Ed Hyman's slides every day, yeah. and I read them every day. Well, you know what I mean. I do know exactly what you mean. Yeah. I read those surveys every single day in some slide form. So how does a, a corporate CEO respond? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of different corporate CEOs, a lot of different reactions. But do they just pull in their horns at this point, in part because it's more expensive, but also in part because 
I, as CEO, don't know exactly where it's going. Well, and of course, it depends on what your business is. So you're seeing some surprising strength given the level of interest rates, given, given how old this recovery simply is. This recovery is more than three years old. It began in the early second half of 2020. Um, you know, you see Walmart doing very well. You see Procter & Gamble doing very well. And those are really broad-based companies. And they're a sign of the resilience of this economy. On the other hand, you know, you see some companies, there, was, there have been some uh, uh, big earnings reports the last day or two, which have been somewhat disappointing, Alphabet and so forth. Really depends on, 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 on the business you're in. Uh, but if you take all these earnings reports together, they do show resilience. I say it's slowing, but there's still considerable resilience, especially businesses that depend on the day in, day out consumer. Mm -hmm. Because the consumer still has, for example, considerable excess, pandemic related excess savings. Um, and as you say, labor markets remain pretty tight, and so consumers are doing well from an employment point of view. And a lot of consumers are right about even in terms of real after-tax income, but still, they are resilient. Uh, we have a lot of uncertainty about exactly where the economy is going, where rates are going, things like that. We also have geopolitical uncertainty right now. Uh, we had Ukraine already, which was, uh, to many, a shock that we'd have a ground war in Europe at this point. Now we have Israel and Hamas, uh, which we've had disputes about before. There have been problems over there, but boy, this is a pretty ugly one. And that's before you get to issues with China and making sure that we're handling that situation with Taiwan sufficiently. How does a corporate CEO internalize that if they do? Well, uh, at, the very, at this very moment, and it could be different tomorrow, uh, the, the tragedies, and they are tragedies, are uh, unfolding in Israel and Gaza, uh, and on the other hand, as you say, Ukraine, uh, are not a major economic event mm -hmm. for the United States of America and for most chief executives, or almost any chief executives. So you're worried about it for lots of reasons, but probably not about what it's going to do to your next quarter or how you're going to plan your next year. That's Roger Altman, founder of Evercore, talking about the shifting sands under the feet of CEOs, both when it comes to finances as well as when it comes to geopolitics. And obviously, he said that some people haven't quite caught up with it yet. There are a lot of fundamental shifts going on. Yeah, I think everyone's trying to come to terms with it right now. Yeah, exactly. And to continue on that point, actually, about what's going on in Israel, we also talk to Tom Nides, who just got done in September of being ambassador to Jerusalem, to Israel for the United States. He then came back to be vice chair of Wells Fargo. And just before we came in the air here, we learned that he is leaving that position to go back and devote full-time to the Middle East. So we're going to hear from Tom Nyes about what's going on behind the scenes over there in efforts to try to prevent this uh, dispute from spreading beyond Israel and Hamas. All right, very uh, timely there. And, of course, he's going to have a lot of other great guests as well, uh, David Weston and Wall Street Week, airing at 6 p.m. Wall Street time a little bit later today. Stick with us here on The Close. We're going to set you up for what's going to be another busy week in financial markets. This is Bloomberg. Carla, it was an incredibly wild week yeah. this week here, despite the fact that the Fed was in a quiet period. A lot, I know. of course. Can you imagine if the Fed officials were speaking as well? I know. Well, <laughs> guess what? A lot of that's going to change next week here. Let's set you up for what to watch, and we have to start off with more earnings. Yeah, McDonald's will be reporting. SoFi will be reporting as well, which will be interesting given the resumption of student loan payments. Yeah, I'm really interested in that too. And you talk about kind of the cross section of the economy, where we're really going to learn a little bit more as to just yeah. how healthy uh, the consumers are. And then, of course, we talk about central bank speak guess what the bank of japan has the a bank of japan yet. will they say anything about yield curve control that is the big question inflation is at two percent again so maybe there's room for doing that yeah that occurs i believe uh what on uh, monday night our time yeah uh, tuesday the morning US. i always get that confused i know with the time it is confusing. Here. maybe they should just standardize the whole world can we do that I mean, time, yeah, I'll, is, just I'll a, talk to someone time is just a construct anyway. And then, of course, I know you've been hurting for any sort of Fed speak where we're going to get a big time. Of course, the two-day Fed meeting and the decision on Wednesday. Right. So FOMC decision at 2 p.m. Jay Powell starts speaking at 2.30 p.m. He's unlikely to do anything is the consensus right now. But what he says about going forward is going to be the key question. And then, of course, once we get through that Wednesday, and hopefully the markets don't implode off of what he has to say, yeah. we get more earnings. And this time, one of the more consequential ones, Apple, set to report on Thursday. Only two of the big seven left to go. Apple is going to be 
critical, especially when it comes to iPhone sales, particularly in China, where there's been a yes. slowdown in demand for those devices. Are you not going to buy a new AirPod case to try to keep every? Uh, keep, you know, uh, keep I, I'm going to try to hold on to my yeah. existing AirPods for as long as possible. Uh, we're also going to get another uh, central bank decision from the Bank of England, and then you come back here to the U.S. on Friday. We get some more economic data here, and of course, this is the one everyone cares about. The big jobs report comes out. This is for the month of October. What happens? The estimate is for 190,000, but last time around, we beat analyst estimates by a lot. All right, a lot to cover next week. We really hope that everyone joins us then. In the meantime, stick around. Balance of Power is coming up next. This is Bloomberg.